did. I couldn't find my old ones. I, I know I've saved them in the past, and I couldn't find any of my old <coughs> planning committees. Uh, Monday should be. Okay. Good evening. Today is the March 24th Planning Commission public hearing. Can I start with roll call, please? Jessica Hearns. Jeff Stick. Lou Tatora. Brian Adams. Mitch Levy. David Baldinger Jr. And on Zoom, Martin, are you there? Martin Kingston. And I think that should be it. Okay, uh, as per usual, before we begin agenda items tonight, if anybody would like to speak uh, public comment on something that is not on tonight's agenda, you can come to the stand and state your name and address and give us your thoughts. Come on down. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Hi, Martin, Sam. <laughs> My name is Sam Rush and I live at 472 8th Street. Um, next to our property um, is a proposal at 512 8th Street. Back in October, um, several of the neighbors um, 
on both sides of the proposal at 512 A Street submitted letters. There were five neighbors that sent significant letters and we gathered many signatures, I believe 25 signatures opposing the development that was um, under review at the time. What they wanna do on five city lots is cram in three lots and they have asked for um, a few variances it has gone and been approved already administratively on these proposals. And in our letters, we did ask for some meetings about it and we wanted to be heard about it. And March 1st, it was approved without any notification to any of us about that. And so I know the planning department is so busy and there are so many things on the plate for um, city staff, but there are several of us neighbors that would like to be heard of our concerns for this developer that has put in this proposal and the hardships that seem apparent to us are only that they are trying to, to build three houses, three lots, and the hardship that we see is that they're just not gonna make enough money on their development. We would prefer, look, put two houses on there, make it more of a neighborhood make it something that doesn't look like it's so crammed in there and work with us as neighbors. We have contacted the attorney for the developer and we've never heard back from her. So we would like the city to hear us and please say, hey, we at A Street with that development that goes in at 512 A Street, we would like the neighborhood to be included in that, um, in that process because we requested it in those letters. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you for those comments. Uh, without trying to get into the weeds on that, I think that there are some processes that she could probably talk with planning staff about appeal processes or call-up procedures um, regarding just what avenues that there are for them without getting in, like I say, into the weeds of that today. Is that correct? Um, well, there is an appeal process. I don't know the dates and when that was actually approved. I don't either, but, the, but maybe she yes, could be encouraged to come, kind of have that conversation uh, with, with you all. So thank you for letting us know. If there's any other public comment not related to an agenda item this evening, seeing none, uh, I will I welcome, you real quickly, I will welcome our commissioner attack. And uh, then if you, do you have a public comment not related to tonight's agenda online? Uh, is, yeah. Can I do that via Zoom? You can do that via Zoom. Uh, yeah, just give us your name and address and, and uh, give us your comments. Yeah, my name's Dave Kleiber. I live at 472 8th Street. And I would like to comment on the same issue at the 412, or I'm sorry, 512 8th Street uh, proposal. And I guess the question that I've had, and I've tried to get answers from a number of people at the city, and I've gotten no response or any answers is if there, because my understanding is that the variances were given an administrative approval because they were quote, minor variances. And when looking through the code, there was nothing that would be identified as a hardship. And I've tried to get answers as to if there is in fact any type of an appeal process for that and how you would potentially go through that appeal and if someone could guide us in that direction, that would be really helpful because so far we've just hit one brick wall after another. Okay, thank you. Thank you for those comments. Yeah, again, I'll just point you guys to, to talking with uh, city planners and uh, seeing if there is a path forward or not. Thank you very much. Any other public comment not related to tonight's agenda? Okay, seeing none, I will go to our first agenda item. Uh, what may look different from our packet, we are going to flip our first and second agenda items. So we'll be starting with PL 2022-005-207 9th Street, the Yampa Valley Kitchen. Is the applicant here for a presentation? He is. Hello, uh, I'm Jeremy McGray. Um, one of the owners of 207 9th Street, which is where Yam Valley Kitchen is currently um, operating out of. Um, the little background, I keep it short and simple because it's not a very um, large request here, but um, 
we purchased that in 2016. Uh, we had Cloverdale in there operating from 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. Um, when they uh, stopped operating, we had Low Country in there from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. Um, and then when they stopped operating, I finally decided after 25 years in this valley and eating out breakfast every morning that I needed uh, to have a breakfast place that uh, was going to be successful there. So uh, we opened up the M Valley Kitchen um, and changed the hours to 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, it's been almost two years now, and it is a, a wonderful restaurant, in my opinion, and it's been the same uh, in terms of feedback that we've gotten from everybody. Um, this last last summer with uh, COVID and the restrictions allowed us to do some outdoor seating, which really tested, I think, that the idea of outdoor seating on that side of Oak Street, which led to a text amendment in the code that would allow for um, accessory use of outdoor seating on that side under you know conditional use review. So little nutshell, um, what we're requesting now is we would just like to extend our dining hours to 9 p.m., so from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m., um, to add dinner and then kind of formally get the outdoor seating approved since that's, you know, it's, it's allowed on that side of the street now via conditional use approval. So we're coming back and amending our conditional use for um, that side of the street uh, to allow for outdoor seating. So that's, that's generally the, uh, the idea. I don't know. Okay. Is that, no, that's, I wasn't that's sure all if you were pausing for something Sweet simple. That's, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. And does staff have a presentation as well? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Kelly Douglas, senior planner. This is a conditional use application. It is for property at the corner of Oak and 9th Street. As Jeremy said, currently operating as the Ampa Valley Kitchen. It's owned commercial Oak One. A condition of approval uh, on this proposal, as well as the previous conditional use approvals that came before it uh, for this restaurant use, is that they operate under an operational plan. Um, the applicant is requesting with this application to amend that operational plan that was approved with CU 2003 uh, to expand the hours of operation to include dinner service and add outdoor seating, accessory outdoor seating. As a refresher, a text amendment to allow accessory outdoor seating in the CK1 zone district was approved in December of 2021, so pretty recently, came before you. Um, staff finds that the accessory outdoor seating complies with the use standards in section 306E2, and that the changes to the operational plan overall comply with the conditional use criteria for approval. Um, and there's been no public comment received in support or opposition to the proposal. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Questions from commissioners? Yes. Or staff, uh, in your project analysis, you say the approvals in perpetuity, unless it ceases for 12 consecutive months, but one of the conditions of approval is that they have to uh, operate under the approved operation plan. If they deviate from the operation plan, is that uh, cancel the in perpetuity part of this, what I'm reading, or what does that, how do those two things affect each other? I think if there was uh, an aspect of the operation of the restaurant, but it was still operating that didn't comply with this plan, that would probably be a enforcement action. If the restaurant use was to cease, then they would have to start over. Well, because I mean, one of the things we, when we talked about the previous one where it was mainly noise impacts, what if there were to continue to be noise impacts? Is that enough to end the conditional use? Because they're not up, they're, they continue to violate the operating plan? Or is that really just a enforcement action? It would be a matter of enforcement. And I think the, the level of compliance, there would be a number of factors that would play into how that enforcement would be handled. The offense, the number of times, um, more than I could say now, but certainly that's the the channel it would go through to be solved or remedied. But none of them would affect the condition, the uh, conditional use approval. Is that what, that's what I'm hearing you say? Chime in? Yeah, please. Um, I think through the enforcement process, there may be um, a situation where uh, an approval could be revoked, but it would not be an automatic. It, Kelly's okay. correct. It would go through enforcement in municipal court, and if if ultimately that were the outcome, then perhaps that's 
where it would end, um, but it would not be the first thing that we would pursue. So staff could not. Correct. Correct. Uh, cancel the conditional approval. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Any additional questions? Um, uh, I have one for the applicant. <clears throat> I, I think I know the answer, but I just wanted to clarify. Um, since the outdoor seating had been allowed, were you not serving dinner? Like it, your hours were just seven to three? <clears throat> Correct. Okay. To five is what we have approved, but yes. Yes. Okay. So when it has been open for dinner before, there were no outdoor seating at the time. Correct. Thank you. <clears throat> you had a question as well? Yeah, that uh, maybe it's kind of a follow-up to that as well. When this first came before us well, a while ago now, the two topics of discussion were noise and parking. The change to operate at night, does that impact, this is, this is to staff, does that impact the evaluation of the parking needed and the parking available uh, for the nighttime operations? No, it does not. The parking standards based on the size of the restaurant, and that's not proposed to change. It's based on net floor area. So we find no difference. And as Jeremy mentioned before, this restaurant used to only operate at night and not during the day. We've found that we we haven't received complaints. Um, certainly there's times when there's more people, there's less people, but it hasn't uh, proven itself to be an issue to the area. Uh, so we feel comfortable recommending approvable approval. Okay, thank you. Sure. Any additional questions? I, I have a follow-up for staff on that one. When um, the parking restrictions are based on size, is that size of the building or would it include this accessory outdoor seating? It's the size of the building, net floor area. Okay, so if there are only 40 seats inside, but 50 outside, we don't look at parking for the 50 outside. That's correct. Okay. Additional questions? Okay. Uh, I think you already spoke to this, um, Kelly, but there's not been any, uh, enforcement issues, I think, to date, right? Certainly no public comment that, that you received with with this application, but any enforcement or any issues, you already mentioned parking, any noise uh, complaints that have had to be followed up on, or has this been operating pretty successfully from all those standpoints? No, from staff standpoint, it's been quiet. We have not heard, uh, we have not heard any complaints about the operations going on here. In fact, with the text amendment that you saw a while back, that was initiated by this applicant as well. And they're, they submitted a lot of uh, letters of support for the restaurant from patrons and people in the area. So generally we've heard nothing and what we have heard has been positive. So we feel, we feel positive. All right, thank you. Uh, I will go to public comment then. Is there any member of the public who wishes to speak on this agenda item? You can come down, state your name and address. Nobody is leaping to their feet. Uh, I don't see anybody, anybody online wishes to speak on this agenda item. Okay, unless there's any final follow-up uh, from the applicant that you wish to do or any final questions from commissioners. I'll close the public portion, come to commissioners for discussion and a motion. I move we approve uh, PL2022055. The conditional use permit with the uh, condition one as in staff report. Second. Any discussion? I guess I'm, I'll support it, but I am disappointed that if there's a con continuous noise op uh, violations or any of the other operational things that it's gonna take a, that staff, that the planning department is not gonna be able to review the conditional use. Uh, the, the lengthy way that that could be corrected is at least unlikely <laughs> to occur. Additional discussion? Uh, yeah, I'll be supporting it. I, I think it's been operating really well. I know over the three applications, maybe it's been, uh, I, I think that the, the use of a restaurant on Oak Street that kind of started out maybe a little bit more controversial or worth considering kind of thing has certainly shown to be successful without complaints as as per my question. I think it's been operating really well and 
being able to push to 9 p.m. as long as that doesn't change it, <laughs> it sounds it sounds uh, still very fully supportable. So sounds sounds great to me. No one else? Then I will call. Sorry. Oh, please. Um, I would just add. I would support it as well. Um, I think it's well justified by both the applicant and staff. Um, and but I did make a note for myself to review parking standards, and perhaps a future discussion would be for us to discuss outdoor and indoor seating for parking. Um, but that doesn't affect this one. You know, there's plenty of um, on-street parking and things like that. So I'd support it. Okay. Then I will call the question. I believe we're all here tonight. So I'll start with Jeff. Aye. 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 Yes. Aye. Martin? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Agenda item number two this evening, public hearings for decision uh, is PL 2021-0078, Ski Hill Subdivision, the Plaza Building. Uh, is the applicant here for presentation? I don't have a, uh, good afternoon, Rob Perlman. I live at 790 Mauna Kea. Lane, and I'm also the president and chief operating officer of Steamboat Ski and Resort Corporation. I do not have a presentation, but I have some opening remarks, if that's okay. Great. Um, first of all, I'm excited to be here uh, and discuss the two projects that are before you on the next two agenda items as a part of our next steps, and I would say leaps forward in terms of our improvements uh, that really are shaping the future of the resort and continue the transformational improvements uh, that we begun last year uh, that is going to make the overall experience at the resort uh, for our guests, for our staff, and our community uh, just incredible uh, going forward. And I always talk about um, when people come to our community, they don't differentiate uh, when they land out at the Hayden Airport, at the Yampa Valley uh, Regional Airport, and when they get to the top of Storm Peak, it's the overall experience. And uh, for years, we've offered incredible guest service and a great skiing experience and uh, a wonderful community with uh, fantastic restaurants. And now we're going to have another one to dine at at night. Um, and uh, what we really needed to address was a couple things at the resort. And uh, you're going to hear about those uh, here um, over the next two agenda items. One is really addressing that base area experience uh, with the addition of the range food hall, the ice skating rink and the stage. Uh, so we can continue to provide a great guest experience and really enhance that. Um, and people will, and our guests and locals and community uh, will be able to gather in the base area with these new amenities and enhancements. Um, <laughs> and really create spaces where people will want to gather and, and hang out uh, at the start of the day, at the end of the day. Um, and we're very excited about that. Um, you'll hear more about that later um, from uh, Jim Schneider, who's our Vice President of Planning, and Eric Smith uh, from Eric Smith and Associates. Associates. Um, and then on the mountain, uh, we're addressing uh, the learning experience for our guests. Um, for far too long, it's been a very congested um, uh, bottom of the mountain where we've had our magic carpets, where we introduce uh, skiers and riders, children and adults to the sports. And it's been intimidating because it's been so congested. And uh, we're, we're talking about Greenhorn Ranch and the wild blue gondola that's gonna take our guests and uh, beginning skiers and snowboarders up to an on-mountain environment uh, where they're gonna be uh, up on the mountain and it's gonna be surrounded by our natural settings and the beauty um, and really be a game changer for the resort in terms of that experience uh, for our guests. And eventually that will lead to us uh, taking that gondola further up to the top of the mountain, which will also address out of base capacity. Um, so again, just uh, very excited uh, to be here, to have the opportunity uh, to uh, put forth uh, both of these um, agenda items uh, to continue uh, our enhancements um, into the future. And the last point I'd make is 
all the while we're doing these enhancements, we want to stay true to our brand, to our character, uh, to what got us uh, to this point long before the ski area um, started in 1963. And um, we're very excited that we've done that so far. And our plan is to continue that going forward is to remain steamboat and just be the better versions of ourselves and, and enhance those deficiencies um, uh, that have really held us back um, in the past. So now I'll turn it over to Adam Ambro, the lead designer from Ginsler, uh, who will talk more about the details and, and actually give a presentation um, uh, on the Steamboat Square projects. And then later, as I said, you'll hear um, Jim Schneider will introduce uh, Eric Smith to talk about um, the Wild Blue Gondola and the Greenhorn Ranch Learning Center. And I'll be back if there's questions. Great, thank you. Uh, I think Adam is online. I believe so, yeah. Great, thanks, Rob. Um, I think Nikki in the audience has our presentation coming up, and there it is. Um, so good evening, everybody. My name is Adam Ambro. I am an architect with Gensler, as, as Rob stated, um, from Denver, Colorado. And we're excited to um, not only share with you the updates um, on the, the base plaza area improvements, um, but I'm really excited about this first slide even because last year when we were here, we talked a lot about what ifs, and now we actually have some updates along the way. And I think a lot of people will recognize this photo um, from the top of the new escalator and stairs that have really started to begin the transformation of the, the base area. Um, Nikki, if we can go to the next slide. Um, a lot of what we're going to talk about, they, they truly are updates because there, there was and has been a vision that's been set for the base area improvements um, that, that go back to last year's planning commission presentations and conversations that we have. And as Rob pointed out, they really are rooted in how do we authentically represent Steamboat um, and continue to be better versions of Steamboat and not reinvent um, both the architectural character and also the guest experience. So. This here again is a slide simply borrowed from last year um, that still serves to this day as a guiding light for the architectural improvements as we move through the course of the project. Um, next slide, Nikki. Um, again, a quick reminder, this is the master plan that, that again was shared last year when we were in the room um, talking about the plaza experience in its totality. And it, it really laid out all the vis vision from the transit center to the left all the way to um, the new gondola building to the right on number seven and all of the points in between. And Nikki, if we go to the next slide real quick, this is really the area that was approved last year. And in fact, construction has started and in some instances been completed over the course of that 12 month period. Um, and what we're gonna talk about today is on the next slide here highlighted in red as both the Plaza Pavilion building, um, as Rob also referred to it as the range, and we'll talk about that in more detail. Um, but then also number five in the red box that we have there, the new stage structure um, that's being added back to the plaza. So we'll keep moving forward. Um, and here is a, is a great uh, visual um, beyond just the master plan. And if we were, um, again, to think about what we were talking about last year, the promenade building, which is the lower level stone facade that, that fronts the mountain, um, is in fact under construction and will be completed this spring. Um, everything below grade is complete. It's just waiting for its architectural facade to, to find its way um, onto it. But what we see above is on the left, the, the plaza building or the range. Um, and then on the other side of the ice rink to the right, we see the new stage structure. Um, and again, this is all both flanking and further activating the plaza um, that is focused around the new ice rink, which was part of last year's development plan and those approvals. Um, and if the, the clock wouldn't have simply ran out, um, would have been constructed this year as well. So that will be coming online here next season as well. Um, so moving on into some of the, the details of the range itself. Um, these are the floor plans from the development plan package. Um, just a quick overview of what the building is and, and how it's going to participate in the plaza. It's about 12,000 square feet total located on two levels. Um, on the bottom, we see the, the first floor. Um, and really what it's intended to be is a food and drink hall that serves the base area. Um, and 
all of the activity that will occur with both the ice rink and, and the guest experience in general. So there are, are four unique food pods that are located in the middle with the back of house kitchen happening there, but also down below in the promenade building that it's connected to. And then to the far right or east is a bar that serves the area and the plaza as well. Um, moving up the stairs and elevators, both either on the west or outside on the east of the building, um, there's another lounge area that happens up there with its own bar um, and some food service. And then to the right, there's about a 1500 square foot exterior terrace that overlooks um, both the ice rink to the north, but also the mountain to the, to the north and to the east. So if we keep moving through. Um, what you've already started to see by way of the escalator and the stair and, and the promenade building and some of the other components that are that are under construction and or completed at this point in time is that again our, our material inspiration and the language that's already been established this is all looking to be simply a continuation of that um, it's a combination of our different stained wood sidings um, a heavy use of the stone that will be consistent throughout the base village area um, and then the heavy timbers that, again, we've already seen on the escalator and stair canopy will find their way both into the range building and the, the stage structure as well. Um, we can go past these. These are, are simply the elevations that, that come from the development plan submittal, um, the technical side of it, but I think we've got some, some better images that really explain um, the building a little bit better. And here we are on the west side. So coming around Christie Sports, we're presented with the front door and I'll, I'll call it one of the front doors to the range. And we'll talk about that in a little bit here. Um, but you'll also see the garage door to the right, which is the Zamboni garage that will service the ice rink um, throughout the winter. Um, if you recall last year, this was, um, this was illustrated as a, a simple Zamboni garage in some of our mechanical area that was done simply because the building wasn't designed yet. And so all of those functions are now housed in this larger building, um, including the mechanical systems that are located behind this facade and screened from the, um, the neighbors to the south as well. Um, so if we keep moving around, um, again, I, I refer to that last image as one of the front doors to the building because here we are facing north to the plaza and the ice rink itself. Um, the intent of the building really is to be as porous as possible, both visually and physically. Um, so that the activity from the plaza really moves inside and out. Um, and if we keep going around again to the next slide, we move over to the west side of the building um, towards the mountain. And here we'll see through the glass is where the bar is. We've got our terrace up above. Um, and then again, the corner of the ice rink. So again, the building's really intended to be a backdrop to the activity at the plaza and provide that food and beverage service um, that's missing right now. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, I believe this is the stage structure. Um, this was not there as part of the last submittal. We had the ice rink, we had the raised stage area, um, but this has been reintroduced to the project, um, but in a different way than the previous stage that was there. Um, you'll see that it shares the same language of the heavy timber and the metal roof as the escalator enclosure that was built this year. Um, however, what makes this different than the previous stage that was there is that it's intended to serve not just those performances and not feel like an empty stage when it's not being used, but it's a little bit more integrated into the plaza so that it's a, simply a shade structure and just a different area um, during those non-event times. So we're excited about opening up the views to all four sides of it this time, and again, letting it uh, be a part of the plaza in a different way than it was before. Um, and then I think finally, with our last slide, this is really what both of these elements are, are all about. They're, it's not about the structure themselves, it's really about the activity that we're looking to bring back to the plaza area. Um, I think the infrastructure that we've all seen in place with the vertical circulation and even just starting to feel what the ice rink's going to be about and the success of the, the new fire pits that are down in the plaza, now it's time to bring the people back there and, and really give them the amenities that are that are needed and, and fulfill the vision that we established last year. Um, and I think that brings us full circle with regard to the plaza building. OK, thank you, Adam. Uh, does staff have a presentation as well? Yes, this is Bob Keenan, principal planner with the city of Steamboat Springs. I have a, just a brief presentation. I think the applicant covered it. Uh, in depth. Um, 
But I'll just kind of highlight some of the more technical aspects of the, the project. Um, right before you, it's a, a development plan uh, for restaurant use, uh, which is a use by right in the Gondola 2 zone district. Um, staff has reviewed it to the community development code and finds it <clears throat> in compliance. And we are recommending approval with the conditions attached to the staff report. Uh, we have received no public written comment ahead of the meeting. And with that, I'll be available for any questions. Thank you. Okay, great. Questions from commissioners? No questions? Wow. Martin, do you have any questions? Um, no, no. Following this with interest, it looks very good, very impressive. Okay, great. Is there any public comment here tonight for this agenda item? If so, you can come down, state your name and address, and give us your thoughts. Try and keep them to three minutes. Hello, Kathy Elliott, 1870 Timothy Drive. I'm a longtime resident and an employee of Christie Sports. To say that Christie Sports is excited to hear uh, construction, noise, growth, uh, we're very excited for this new plaza building because it means that more guests, more visitors and, and locals will want to come down to the base area and spend time during the day, whether they're a skier or not, they'll come down during the summertime. The plaza building is going to add more restaurants, more dining options to be at the base area, to go along with an incredible ice skating rink that's going to draw families and again, non-skiers down to the space area. In the summertime, it's gonna bring soccer players, any other activities to come and spend the day. But what that means is this revitalized base area is providing a better traffic flow for shops and restaurants that are already on the base area. It's going to mean a more welcoming environment for guests to come down to the base area and shop, whether it be in the summer or in the winter time. So Christie Sports is very much behind this project. We're excited for it. We're willing to sacrifice some little dust and noise because we know the overall pro finished product is going to benefit all of us as a local community members and for our visiting guests. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Any additional public comment? Dan Perello, General Manager of the Sheraton Steamboat, 3211 Snowflake Circle. I'm here to speak in favor and support of the two agenda items that Ski, Por Ski Corps is putting in front of you this evening. Uh, this project and these enhancements will allow our world-class destination resort to continue to be competitive in this market and continue to serve our local residents' needs with restaurants, retail, and entertainment venues at the base area of the mountain. Sheraton Steamboat knows that there's going to be a lot of construction disruption. Uh, we hear that all the time from our hotel guests as we've gone through renovations and as Ski Corps has gone through renovation in the past. But again, as said earlier, it's well worth the effort and the time and the disruption to build a world-class resort and continue to attract our guests and our local residents to the base area. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional public comment? Is there anyone online who'd like to speak to this agenda item? Can I mute yourself? Let us know. Okay, see none, uh, unless there's any final follow-up from the applicant uh, or final follow-up from staff. Guessing no. Right, no, thank you. I will close the public portion, come to commissioners for discussion and a motion. Well, I, I just think I'm excited that this is moving forward. And I think it's a good thing for, as some of the commenters mentioned. Uh, so I, I, I'm definitely be in support of that. Um, as such, I, Motion to approve PL 20210078. With four conditions? With conditions. Do we have a second? Second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? I was glad to see that this application pretty much falls in line with what we saw last year with, with no variances. I, there's nothing to do but to say, nice project. I like the looks and I'll be supporting it. Additional discussion? 
Okay, I'll, I'll echo your thoughts, Rich. I, I'm very excited about it. I think it's it's a project that looks like it fits its surroundings. It's a project that didn't need variances. It's a project that's adding uh, what I think has been missing at the base area for a long time. Uh, I'm nothing but thrilled for it. Very much gonna be supporting the motion. Any other discussion? Martin, any discussion from you? No, not at all. Very excited indeed. It's good to see it moving forward. Great. Then I will call the question. Aye. 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 Yes. Aye. Martin? Yes. Motion passed unanimously. Thank you. <clears throat> Moving on to agenda item number three. These are uh, agenda items for recommendation to council. Uh, this is PL 20210078 for the Wild Blue Gondola. For the record, uh, Baldinger will be stepping down on this item. Okay. Thank you. You misquoted the number, I think. Four eight. I have four eight. Is that not true? I thought you said seven eight. Did I say seven eight? Four eight. Sap can have a presentation. Uh, yes, good evening. Jim Schneider, 1355 Harwick Circle, and also Vice President uh, Planning and Development for the ski area. Um, thank you. As uh, we Rob talked about before, we have both uh, base area improvements, we have on mountain improvements. And so this was to talk about the first leg of the Wild Blue Gondola, which consists of a lower terminal, mid terminal, a food structure for uh, feeding our programs and a maintenance uh, bay for the maintenance of our gondola cabins. And uh, we're really excited about this project as well. Uh, truly a transformational project. Uh, uh, excellent uh, new um, uh, area to teach our lessons and, and for beginner guests to go and learn uh, to ski and ride, uh, liberating the base area of the magic carpets and really freeing up uh, that. So with that, I'm gonna introduce Eric Smith uh, with Eric Smith Architects uh, to give a more detailed presentation. Good, thank you. <clears throat> uh, good evening, Eric Smith with ESA Architects, 600 South Lincoln. Uh, with me tonight is uh, one of the other partners in our office that spent a lot of time, Kate Leggett, who's worked on this project extensively for months now. Um, I'll just run through a quick overview and answer any questions. This image in the screen in front of you is the mid station, if you will. And the structure in the foreground is the sprung structure that will service our food venue for all of the snow sports dining program up there. And you can see the angled roof is the turn station on the gondola and the building just beyond is the maintenance building that will service the gondola cabins that require routine maintenance on a daily basis. So next. This just gives you some sort of an overview. You can see the lower terminal location here, and this is just in perspective of the overall mountain. You can see where the turn station is located and where the general learning terrain is located. There you can follow the blue line up there for the gauntlet of the turn station, shows all of the terrain that's been constructed to date for that learning center at the mid section of the mountain there. Next. This is just an indication of the base there, sort of an overview. You can see the wild blue gondola lower terminal leg on the upper part of the sheet. I don't have a laser pointer here to point at that, but, um, and then you can see where uh, Christie is located and the steamboat gondola that was pulled back out of the gondola building uh, previously. And so, oh, thanks, Bob. Uh, that'll make it a little easier. So. There is the base for Wild Blue located here. It will have a similar platform and loading facility as is constructed on the steamboat gondola that was completed in 2021. So essentially the base facility gets located here and the Christie, which is here, we get moved south out of the way so we can put the base facility for the Wild Blue gondola in that location. This is the base terminal shows basically the Doppelmeyer structure for the enclosure of all of the equipment for the gondola. There's an operator cabin located directly to the north and then a storage building that includes the boiler and some general maintenance storage 
and boiler for the snow melt on the platform for the staging and loading for the gondola. Next. This is the mid station. This is a view. This is the base station, a view looking sort of from the south, if you will, to the base terminal structure. That's the maintenance facility, the loading platform, uh, the RFID gates in this location. And this image is obviously a summer in image, so it does not show the snow pillow. When that snow pillow is added in the winter, it essentially is graded up level with the platform so people can walk on levels. That railing will be removed and you'll have actually have flat access onto that terminal loading platform in the winter. Next. This just shows the location of the turn station, which will be the mid station on the gondola and the location of the sprung structure, which is just to the north, which will be relocated down from where it presently sits above rendezvous saddle. And then all of this is basically the terrain learning area for the snow sports school that essentially is uh, graded and exists today, but without access from the gondola. This is the gondola line that goes down to the base of the mountain. It makes the turn station here. And then on the second phase, it will go on up to the top of the mountain from that location. Next. This is a blow up of that mid station shows the turn station on the gondola and the sprung structure located just to the north. And then the maintenance building for the gondola located just to the south. So essentially the cabins from the gondola structure will be able to come off on a rail into the maintenance building, down a, a lift, if you will, into the maintenance bay where they do grip maintenance and routine maintenance on those gondola cabins. And what you see just to the right are the emergency generators that are located in this area. Next. This is a view looking downhill, if you will. You can see the sprung structure on the right, the maintenance structure, which is just beyond the gondola terminal. And in the foreground, those are the emergency generators. Again, this is a summer image, so it doesn't show so the snow pillow, which will bring that grade up several feet around those structures. Next. That's more of an aerial view looking down with the sprung structure in the foreground. It shows the turn station on the gondola and the maintenance building. You can see this elevated section here is where the gondola cabins have to come offline into the maintenance building. Then they go down where this slope proof section is to get down into that lower gondola bay. There is a variance request as part of this application, which deals with this portion of the structure, which is up in the air because we have to bring those gondola cabins off on a rail level with where the upper terminal is. Once those cabins get into the maintenance building, we can drop those down on, an, on a lift basically and do the maintenance in the main start of this part of the structure. But that portion of the building has to be at that elevation so that these rails can bring the gondola cabins off level. And that cabin elevation is set by the physical requirements of how high that terminal has to set above grade to be able to unload. Next. These are just a couple of additional views. This is a, a view coming downhill, if you will, on the gondola. You can see the maintenance structure off on the left, the terminal cover here, and the sprung structure on the right. The view to the upper section is the view going up the gondola. You can see the um, the gondola terminal itself and the sprung structure in the background there. Next. This is just a floor plan of the sprung structure. We'll be adding facilities within that structure, including a kitchen, which doesn't exist in the existing building before it gets located because this will serve as the food service venue for the, for the learning terrain center. Restrooms are located in the corner here. Kitchen is located in the other corner. The majority of the rest of that structure will be open seating. Next. This is the maintenance structure floor plan. It shows essentially where the gondolas come in off of the terminal. They drop down this elevator, if you will, and then they come into the service area of the gondola. And there's a platform in there so that people can work up on the grip level of those cabins as they come into the maintenance facility. This facility is about 7,500 square feet. The uh, sprung structure is about 7,000 square feet. 
You'll notice on the outside, there's also a rail that drops around for storage of those cabins because a lot of those cabins will be able to be stored in here in the evening as well. Next. I think that may be it. Any questions? Okay. Thank you, I appreciate it. You're welcome. The staff have a presentation as well. Yes, we do. Bob Keenan, Principal Planner, City Planning Department. And just as a follow-up on, uh, again, some of the more uh, technical details of the application, um, the applicant is applying for a development plan, major variance to average plate and overall height in a conditional use. Uh, planning staff has um, provided the planning commission with a memo with a, a couple of additional updates since the staff report. One was a revised condition of approval dealing with Mount Warner Water, Sewer and Water Service, and uh, the one uh, written public comment that we had received. And then earlier in the week, pr we provided uh, attachment F, which is the uh, proposed development agreement for the application. Uh, staff has uh, reviewed the application for compliance with the Community Development Code, and we find that uh, it is in compliance, and we are rec recommending approval with the conditions as noted in the staff report and the amended uh, memo. And uh, with that, we'll be available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Questions from commissioners? Um, I have a question for the applicant, perhaps the architect. Um, you spoke to how the maintenance building functions and why the, you need the two variances for that portion of the building. But could you speak to what an alternative would be if the variances weren't approved? Like, would they have to be much smaller gondola cabins? Like, what really predicates why you need the six feet? If you flip back maybe to one of those slides of the gondola, just the gondola terminal building maybe, What happens in the operation of this gondola at the mid station, mm -hmm. it will essentially on the lower section come up, go around a bull wheel there. The gondola will be able in the future to continue on up the mountain. But at this turn station, um, we need to be able to physically get the cabins offline. So mm -hmm. once they come off the cable, they ride up on a rail. Those have to be able to be physically pulled out from under the terminal structure mm -hmm. and into a maintenance building. So where those come into the maintenance building, they need to really come off level with the rail where the gondola is essentially riding, where that cabin is riding. And then once we get into the maintenance building here, we drop them down quickly down a lift that gets the gondolas down to a lower level of cabins, if you will. But to physically get them off of the line, we can't drop them off the line at the terminal. They have to physically get out from underneath this terminal into that maintenance bay and then drop down, which is why we need that variance for height. And the height of the building is set really by the platform heights. Mm -hmm. And where this is located, we really need to create the snow pillow where as people get off of this gondola, they can get off level. So it sets that height, which we can't really drop, or they're climbing upstairs, if you will, getting off of the lift. So that's what really determines that height as that cabin comes off the gondola. The only alternative would be to try to you know, do cabin maintenance somewhere else, like at the base area, for instance. And we really think that doing the cabin maintenance in this location and keeping that out of the base area is the most appropriate thing. Okay, so would it be safe for me to summarize that the, the reason for the request of the variance is twofold, one for accessibility of the skiers, and second for just operational reasons that it's wiser to do maintenance at the mid station. Yeah, it's really the most logical place for us to be able to do the maintenance mm -hmm. on the gondola is in this location. And it allows us obviously to do maintenance under phase one on those cabins as well, as opposed to waiting until the upper terminal was constructed. Okay, thank you. Additional questions? No. <clears throat> Seeing none, I'll go to public comment. Is there any member of the public who wishes to speak on this agenda item? State your name, address, try and keep your comments at three minutes. Hello, Gardner Flanagan, 1855 Fish Creek Falls Road. 
I'm the executive director of Steamboat Adaptive Recreational Sports, otherwise known as STARS. We have had a long partnership with the Steamboat Ski and Resort Corporation as providing the adaptive snow sports programming for locals and visitors alike at the ski area. And we are enthusiastically endorsing the uh, concept of the blue sky gondola to the new teaching area. Uh, as Rob had mentioned before, it has it is a bit chaotic, especially for someone with a disability uh, who may have sensory issues to begin with. Um, so you can imagine a visually impaired veteran trying to make his way around the base area right now to get to a learning area. Uh, having the ability to simply get on a 10, ten passenger gondola and go to a gradiated teaching facility is going to be a game changer in the snow sports industry, but especially in instructing individuals with disabilities. Um, the uh, opportunity to have uh, participants and sit skis get onto a cart and wheel directly onto the gondola and off the gondola is going to make the accessibility that much easier. So we're enthusiastically thumbs up on this project. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional public comment? Hi there, Greg Dotson, 2405 Storm Meadows Drive, um, known as, uh, as the uh, phase one and phase two townhomes up on Storm Meadows. Um, I'm, all, I'm a board member and an owner and a, a permanent resident in the, in the complex. Um, I can tell you that the, the board has met and reviewed the plans just recently. Um, we, we are fully supporting this with the, the gondola itself is about 650 feet away from our property. It runs, uh, we are on the right away um, adjacent line to the, to the corp. Um, I, in my role at the uh, HOA and as a permanent resident, I also speak very frequently with all of our owners and all the guests that stay there. And to a T, everybody is fully uh, excited about this project and there's been no negative comments at all from, from our perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional public comment? Seeing none in person, is there any uh, member online on our Zoom call who would like to speak public comment on this agenda item? I would. Please. My uh, good evening. My name is Don Lewis, 1855 Ski Time Square Drive. Uh, I am the president of the Torian Plum Homeowners Association, and I'm speaking tonight on behalf of our 94 residential owners and 23 commercial owners. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Our community is very much in favor of this project. It will improve access up the mountain for our many owners and guests and will only enhance our ski in ski out location. This project will increase the vitality of the base area and the Torian Plum Plaza in which we have recently invested millions of dollars and which we consider an integral part of the base area. We value SSRC as our partner and we're very supportive of the significant investment that they are making in the ski area specifically with this project. Great, thank you for those comments. You're welcome. Are there any questions for me? No, none for you, thank you very much. Thank you. And any additional public comments on Zoom? Okay, seeing none, uh, is there any final follow-up from the applicant? Any final comments or thoughts? Okay, any from staff? No, thank you. And any final questions from commissioners? Close the public portion, come to commissioners for discussion and a motion. I'll move to approve PL 2021-0048 with the 12 conditions as indicated in the staff report. Second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? Yeah, I uh, just, oh, just want to be sure. Uh, Bob mentioned a additional condition that's not in the package. Is that one of the 12 conditions or was there a 13th condition? Uh, it was a revised condition and 
I'd consider the memo part of the staff report, but it's okay. a clarification. Thank you. That's all it was I definitely guess. a reached interpretation. No, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it. Uh, any other discussion? Rich, you were about to say something? No? Oh, terrific. Um, I just wanted to speak to the variances um, and commend the design team and whoever else was involved. Um, they could have easily asked for that entire building to require a variance instead of the entire mechanics of putting that thing down and moving it all around on this um, elevator. And I think they really worked hard to make sure that the variance they were asking for was exactly what was needed for the operations. So. Additional discussion? Okay, uh, yeah, um, I wish I had more questions uh, just for the sake of, you know, lending the weight of it to, that this project has. I, it's very exciting that, that this gondola is gonna be going in. Uh, don't have any questions because as Commissioner Hearns already mentioned, it's, it's well-designed. I understand the reason for the variances. They're very supportable. Um, they do seem like they're very minimized and certainly mitigated to any impacts from any other neighboring properties. Um, yep, fully support it. Excited to see it go in. Unless there's any other discussion. Okay, then I'll call the question. Aye. Aye. Back to Jess. Aye. 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 Yes. And Martin? Yes. That motion passed unanimously. Thank you. Oh. Moving on to a quieter room, it looks like. Yeah. Agenda item number four this evening, DPA-21-08, Crawford at Burgess Creek. Is the applicant here for a presentation this evening? Yes, I am. Yep. Yeah, the applicants will be online. Oh, terrific. Welcome. Take it away when you're ready. Good evening. Uh, this is Philip Southwick, architect at LM Holder. We're talking to you about Crawford at Burgess Creek this evening. Um, and I'll see if this will let me grab the screen. Um, what we are doing is we're putting six residential units on um, Burgess Creek, which is uh, just up uh, just up the hill from Clock Tower, right before Ski Time Square. Uh, we have a very steep uh, parcel with the G2 zoning. And uh, I just am gonna show a couple images of what we are working on. Um, this is uh, uh, from the Burgess Creek side. Uh, it's going to read as uh, six uh, townhouse-like units. They're joined together, uh, three here and then three just beyond. Uh, so they read as a very intimate scale uh, with a kind of uh, residential scale parking plaza up on the Burgess Creek side. And then uh, there are shots through and between the pairs that you can look downslope toward Mount Werner. And then uh, from the lower side, if you're actually in the Burgess Creek, the creek looking up, um, uh, we will have some woods. And then beyond that is the three-story building. And then we'll talk a little bit about what's below. So we're coming in this evening because the uh, slopes out there um, are typically about uh, four times as steep as a as a handicap ramp uh, where uh, most of our uh, slopes are well above 30%. So we do have a slope variance. And then also the massing of the building, uh, we're trying to um, perch uh, on this very steep terrain. Uh, so we have a massing variance as well. So I'll, I'll come back in um, and, and talk about some of that as we answer the questions, mm -hmm. but uh, that's the intro. Okay, thank you. And as I ask if staff has a presentation, uh, I should have asked uh, earlier, but are we, sometimes we review applications together when a preliminary plat is kind of reviewed in conjunction with the development plan? Is that kind of what we're looking at tonight or how does staff want to approach this? We can, I think we can have one discussion for both applications um, as the, the plat 
is um, really supportive of the development. So the, the property itself does need to be platted, but the way it's being platted is um, very consistent with the development. Uh, I think we would still need to discuss each of the variances for the different projects, the conditional use, and then take uh, two votes. So. Okay. And, and along those lines, uh, Mr. Southwick, is that with your presentation, you already gave us some thoughts. Is that okay that we're doing both of these in conjunction, one discussion? Uh, yes, that sounds fine. Okay, great. All right, thanks, Toby, if you have a presentation. Okay. Um, so this is a development plan, uh, major variance and conditional use. Um, I'll talk about those first for six multiple family residential units on an unplatted property. Uh, the conditional use is for multiple family residential and the pedestrian active building frontage. And the variance is to the building massing step back design standard. Um, the project is zone G2 uh, and it is unplatted. Um, there were two engineering variance requests that were approved during the development of the property um, for driveway and drainage standards. Um, they didn't result in a variance that needs to be decided by city council. Uh, the step back variance, we are supporting that variance. We um, find that they have um, managed the impacts to meet the intent of that standard, but we can um, review that in more detail. We also find that the conditional use request is supportable um, as they are providing um, several pedestrian connections to the ski time square portion of this um, or to the ski time square direction as this property doesn't exactly front on ski time square, but they are providing pedestrian connections in that direction. Um, we find that the project is consistent with the area community plan and the um, future mountain area master plan, though that's not adopted. Um, we believe that the general direction of the mountain area master plan um, will be in support of our current area community plan. So this project is um, not inconsistent with that. Uh, we also find that it's consistent with the purpose of the zone district and will be managing impacts. Um, regarding the uh, variance, um, the project is proposing, so the variance is to a step back standard. We require um, that the building step back when it has an unbroken wall between 12 and 45 feet. The applicant in this case is uh, elevating a walkway at the base of the building, which reduces the unbroken height of the building to less than 45 feet. So we believe that they are meeting the intent of that standard. Um, and we are recommending approval um, with several conditions. So um, I think we can both answer questions. I guess, real quick, I will review the preliminary plat um, just so you have that information as well. The, the plat will support this development. It does have a variance to um, usable lot area. So there are several steep slopes on that property. Um, it is fairly difficult to develop that property without developing any of the steep slopes. So they are minimizing um, their impact to those slopes, keeping their development close to Burgess Creek, and then putting some of the rest of that property, some of it with steep slopes into um, an open space area with some pedestrian connections that cross that. So again, we find um, that we can support that and that it meets the criteria the revised condition that I provided to you is for condition number one on that preliminary plat. It just removes the permanent stormwater quality treatment facilities as a critical improvement. There are drainage improvements that are included there. And so that was a redundant item that can be deleted. Um, and we've reviewed that with the applicant and they accept it, so. Okay. Thank you very much. Questions from commissioners? Um, I had a question on condition number four for staff. Um, I believe it's the one getting to the concept of community amenity in section 440 of the code, perhaps. Um, I just hadn't seen anything like this before. So I was asking more of a procedural question. Um, if the cost of the community amenity is um, too low to hit that 1% target, does that become an administrative approval? Does that come back here as like an addendum to a development plan if they were have to contribute something additional? I think because we've got that um, 
information in there. So they, what they did is they provided a, a construction estimate and then mm -hmm. provided an estimate that showed that their community amenities were equivalent to that amount. Um, I believe that kind of with the language there, if they need to contribute more, we do allow in our code to do a, um, a monetary contribution mm -hmm. or a building contribution. So I think they could just provide a monetary contribution or they could demonstrate that they built additional amenities either way at their building permit. So I think to answer your question, it would be administrative with the guidance in our code and the language we've given ourselves in the condition. Okay, thank you. Additional questions? I had one. Uh, in your project analysis, you spoke to how this, uh, the conditional use of uh, pedestrian use on the pedestrian, excuse me, residential use on the pedestrian active frontage met what you thought was the future goals of the mountain area master plan. And I just wanted to see more of that since we don't have an adopted mountain area master plan, what, where that thoughts, those thoughts are coming from. From what I understand, um, the mountain area master plan will um, support our current area community plan with policies that direct zoning and uses and density of development. So our mountain area master plan isn't going to, I think, dramatically change um, the types of uses and conditional uses that would be allowed in the mountain area. So um, I found and said that this project is consistent with our area community plan. So it still should be consistent with our mountain area plan if those two plans are consistent as I understand them to be. I mean, I guess my main concern was that G2 is specifically called out to be an, an intense commercial and residential development. And with the, with the conditional use of the ground floor use, we're not getting any commercial. And I haven't seen a plan that says how far our dense commercial gondola based gondola zone is supposed to go, um, being it right adjacent to whether that used to be ski time, the ski time square condos is the lot, the mm -hmm. empty lot below that. I mean, that's obviously an area that's going to be very vibrant in the future. And I'm just trying to understand how far that vibrancy is, that commercial vibrancy is supposed to extend. I think that our mountain area master plan will probably be looking at those areas and, and it may guide some, some zoning changes in the future. I'm not sure, but um, the, the G2 zoning that is applied to that property now did probably reference um, the older master plan, which showed a road being built at the bottom of that property, the property we're looking at. Um, as far as I know, that road will probably not be built. So the commercial vibrancy on Burgess Creek Road doesn't seem as viable. It seems more viable on a, on a ski time square drive type road. So because this property is providing pedestrian connections along Burgess Creek Road and down to towards Ski Time Square Drive, we feel like that that is an appropriate transition to the residential across Burgess Creek Road and most likely the residential that will be adjacent to this property. Um, and we will hope to see some commercial development um, in the properties along Ski Time Square Drive or any future road development down there that we do. Okay. Um... Second, the connections that you're talking about, the pedestrian connections, are those the amenity contributions? Are those being calculated as that? I, I guess I missed that in the packet exactly what those contributions are. The amenity contributions um, are, they've got some seating areas and some um, fire pit areas that will be available for their residents and as public amenity contributions, the walkways, are also contributions, but the walkways are a requirement on their on their own. And then they have some private amenities for their development as well. Okay, thank you. Additional questions? I have one, but I can't I, I don't know if it's better for discussion or not. We'll see where it goes. Um I have a question for staff, I suppose, of how. I understand when we have some development plans, we say, hey, you have to have sidewalks, even if those sidewalks don't connect to anything, like they might in the future. So you could tell me that this is just similar, but 
the walkway that would go towards Ski Time Square just abruptly ends at a rather steep grade, like where there are fire hydrants and storm drains. Um, so I'm having a tough time interpreting that as a community amen amenity. Could you describe that for me? Yeah, so the community amenity again is, is the, the seating area and the fire pits that are adjacent to that walkway. The walkway does support the project and can be a, a public amenity as well. What we would anticipate in the future is that the, the property below um, would need to connect to that sidewalk or if they were unable to, they might have to redevelop portions of that sidewalk to make that pedestrian connection happen again to get. So we often say that the development has to provide connections to and through the property. So mm -hmm. that one would have to do it as well. So this, this pedestrian connection really does get people from this development down to Ski Time Square. And we hope that it will, you know, be an adjacent connection in the future. Mm -hmm and from Burgess Creek Road, because they'll be able to walk mm -hmm. along the sidewalk from Burgess Creek Road and eventually come down mm -hmm. through this pedestrian connection. So um, it's incumbent upon us to make sure future development makes those connections, mm -hmm. or um, if they don't, if the lower development, again, doesn't want to connect in that location, they'll have to maybe build another sidewalk along the base of that adjacent property or mm -hmm. something to, to make their proposed connection work. Okay, so my follow up, that's excellent, and I thank you, um, would be, I know you only have to look at the proposal in front of you, but I'm concerned where this um, sidewalk just kind of ends, if it will, if you looked at if it has the ability to connect to a future one, just given that there's the fire hydrant and the drain, like, is it lined up in such a way where it wouldn't impact those objects? I'm not sure if we've looked exactly at that, but what we have looked at is the um, the water and sewer connections. So mm -hmm. that is the most viable location for all of those water and sewer connections. So mm -hmm. there will be easements and, and grading done in that area. Um, and so those will be generally commonly shared areas between all those properties. Um, there is, it's a fairly large sewer main and water main, I think through there. So I think it's a likely spot where the properties will need to coordinate um, on other features and they may be able to, hopefully we'll be able to coordinate on the sidewalk, so. Thank you. Additional questions? I have one. Uh, I was looking at the picture, is the sidewalk one of the uh, administrative approval variances that AR mentioned the sidewalk appears to be a lot closer to the road than our uh, separation standard includes. The sidewalk wasn't um, an engineering variant. So there were driveway standards, I think, to allow two driveways and I think the driveway width and then a drainage easement standard. Um, I think it's less, uh, the width of the drainage easement is less than our standard. So the sidewalk um, meets our requirements as far as I know. So. Okay. Thank you. Additional questions? Uh, then at this point, I'll open up to public comment. Is there any member of the public who wishes to speak on this agenda item? If so, you can give us your thoughts. Not seeing anyone. If there's anyone online who would like to speak on this agenda item. Also seeing none. Uh, unless there's any final follow-up. Uh, Mr. Southwick from the applicant side. Yes, I have a couple of very brief comments. I, I love your questions because you're getting right to the heart of what we've been working on uh, internally and with staff. Um, we've really been trying to perch our facility up near Burgess Creek uh, Road. So keeping that sidewalk and parking as small scale as possible so that we don't end up with a four or five story difference between uh, the bottom level of the building and the street. We're really trying to keep it all very tight. Um, also working out how the uh, stairs stitch the upper level down to the lower level has been really important. You can see some of that on this image where you're looking from the downhill side, there's stairs working down between the buildings, and then there's a sidewalk here 
that is sometimes uh, integrated with uh, seating and fire pits and other amenities. Sometimes it's integrated with some landscaping that we have up here. And then sometimes it's a view out over the slopes. Uh, so we've really been trying to balance that. And then um, just working out to the, um, just working out the sectional experience of this, um, which is um, probably best shown here that sometimes we are, um, this is the plaza level. This is the Burgess Creek level in the middle. There's a uh, residential level above, some there, and there's a residential level below. And we've pulled that sidewalk up so that people that are walking through this site, uh, I've looked at your master plans and the various versions. And one of the things that's really missing here as part of the sustainability and connectivity uh, goals of the plans is uh, just to be able to move from the, the Burgess Creek Drive down to the other areas that are below us. And we're actually aiming for a recorded easement that has been prepared off site, ready to receive our circulation. So we're really tr working to get people through the topography of this site down past our building, uh, through the amenities that we're building, and then all the way down to the easement. Thank you. Great, thank you. And any final response from staff? No, thanks. Okay, and final questions from commissioners. Okay, close the public portion, come to commissioners for discussion and a motion. I'll move, we approve DPA 21-08 uh, with conditions one through 13 as presented in the staff report. Second. Motion and a second, any discussion? Yeah, I'd just like to comment on the, I mean, this is a really steep sloped area. And putting this there, I think is a, a good thing overall. I assume the technical aspects have all been addressed in some form or fashion. Uh, so that's pretty impressive. I look forward to seeing some of the stuff below that get developed sometime in the near future. Additional discussion? Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about how I, see the conditional use here um, and that allowing it to be fully residential um, to me makes sense for this particular lot. You know, like just driving Burgess Creek, I don't ever really wanna stop. Like I wouldn't even wanna pull into these driveways. So I wouldn't probably frequent a business that's there if I was driving. And then coming up from um, the other side, this the steep is so great, like great. I, and the drainage issues there, or not the drainage issues, but just like all the water and all the topography and the mud, I just don't see it being successful if it was commercial. Um, and I see it just being more successful if it was residential. And then the fact that they're not using the entire lot, you know, it says a lot to me about, um, you know, just like maintaining the integrity of the slope and the environmental components and all the trees and the creek and things. Um, so for this particular lot, I'm not bothered by the conditional use and not having commercial on the pedestrian active frontage. Uh, I would agree with Jessica about the uh, ground floor uses. I really just wanted to bring it up in the context of the referencing a plan that hasn't been adopted and a plan that is so out of date, our currently adopted plan that's so far out of date that it's, dare say, ridiculous. Um, so I agree with you on that. And the other one is the, uh, the, the building massing and the, the variance on step backs that we didn't really discuss much. I think architecturally, they did something to uh, break up that visual massing. And again, because of the steep slope, they're gonna have a very a narrow building for lack of a better word, or one that's not very deep, which doesn't leave a lot of room for step backs either. Um, so I think that makes a reasonable uh, justification for the massing variance. Additional discussion? Okay, I'll just uh, uh, chime in and agree with you, <laughs> Commissioner Hearns, that, uh, uh, I feel that it would probably make more sense to rezone this away from the G2 uh, high intensity commercial than it does to expect a commercial 
is applicable on this site. But rather than rezone, I think that that what they're doing uh, in this particular case, asking for this conditional use, um, is is very appropriate. So um, just to add a little a little clarity to that. Um, as far as the step backs, um, I don't really have much more to add than to agree with Commissioner Levy on that one. Um, certainly, the topography on the site. Um, has been a problem for anybody who's tried to work on a project on here uh, and trying to stay within overall heights, average plate heights, create a project that you can create accessibility through um, for that community amenity, uh, I think is probably what lends them to the design that they have more so than anything else. And I think it's supportable as a variance. Um, I didn't have very many questions uh, during our questioning period about the sidewalk because it looks remarkably similar to an older project that I was able to participate in uh, earlier on in this thing where they we talked a great length about how the sidewalk would connect down, how it is not a full connection because this property doesn't have the ability to get down to the full connection. Uh, and and I, I just found it very supportable then as to the individual project having met its portion of that contribution, uh, even though there's still some work to be done to make that a good connection at, at that time. So just kind of lending as to uh, some additional thoughts uh, that I had on that matter. Um, but all those in combinations while be supporting the motion. Uh, anybody else not have a chance to give their discussion? Or Martin online? No, great project, difficult site. Um, all the above mentioned uh, reasons that the uh, commission, all the commissioners have shown support. I totally concur with not really applicable for commercial, great design. I love the breakup of the massing. Um, and I, I think the design is, is, is right on for this particular site location. Okay, great. In that case, then I will call the question. Commissioner Hearns. Aye. 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 Yes. Martin? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Um, moving on then to next item with the preliminary plat, uh, do we have discussion and motion? Move, we approve PP 21-08 uh, with the six conditions of approval as stated in the staff report second motion is second and kind of similar to tom your great point from the first one you mean the updated revised condition um was there an updated revised? that that's the one we're moving oh, to, that's the one to redundancy that's the updated revised commission Thank you. Sorry about perfect that. yep exactly thank you uh any discussion on this agenda item this motion no i think this uh, i would agree this just supports uh what we just approved um I think the, again, the steep topography, the existing topography is very mitigated within the design uh, and and is supportable as the applicant is presenting it. Unless there's any other discussion, I will also call this to question. Aye. 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 Yes. Yes. Martin? And that also passes unanimously. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Agenda item number six, PL 2022 uh, Office Park Subdivision, I guess I'll call it that. Is the applicant here this evening for a presentation? Uh, Chairperson, before we start with this item, um, for agenda items six and seven, I'll have to recuse myself because I live within 300 feet of one of the properties. And while legal says that that is not a reason for recusal, it's my understanding that city council would prefer that we do. So I will be back for number eight. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the reasoning too, appreciate it. Uh, yeah, okay, moving on. Is the applicant here for a presentation? Just trying to keep track of all my fellow commissioners. Ready? Uh, Bill Rankish with Steamboat Architectural. Our, our office is at uh, 345 Lincoln. Um, tonight we are just looking for a reason. There's two, two components of this. One is an amendment to the land use plan and the other is a rezone uh, for, C, uh, for, from, for three lots from CN to MF3 to make it more 
homogeneous with the adjacent um, properties. Uh, the staff report does a good job of outlining what we've done. So I just defer to Toby and, and available for any questions. Okay. Thank you. And does staff have a presentation as well? Sure. Um, so this is a um, request to change the future land use map classification from neighborhood commercial to neighborhood residential medium for three properties on the corner of Welton Creek Road and Apres Ski Way. Um, there was a previous development um, proposal and plat on the northern, I guess it's the uh, eastern property, eastern corner of that intersection. Uh, the plat was approved, the development um, plan was put on hold after the last discussion from Planning Commission, so there has not been a decision on that yet. Um, each of these properties is currently zoned neighborhood commercial and um, there is a, like Bill said, there is a um, zone map amendment that's concurrent with this application, but right now we'll talk about the community plan. Um, the proposal is to change the future land use map classification from neighborhood commercial to neighborhood residential medium. The adjacent um, properties you can see on the map are in the neighborhood residential medium category for that area. So this these properties were to be uh, part of a commercial node in our um, in our community. So looking at all of the criteria, um, we have found that the conditions have changed a bit in this area and neighborhood residential medium has emerged as a more appropriate transitional land use classification. As you cross Walton Creek Road to the north, the future land use map transitions into resort residential. So neighborhood medium does provide a good transition um, in both directions to resort residential and further to the south to the neighborhood residential medium land uses and land classification. Um, this project will allow for additional residential uses. Um, it is already served by all of the services um, and it's already within the city. Um, we do feel like the neighborhood residential land use classification does allow for some limited commercial development. So some commercial development could still occur on this corner with this land use classification. Um, and we find that it is consistent with several policies in our plan. So uh, with that, we are recommending approval of this project. Thank you, Toby. Uh, questions from commissioners? I'll start with one. Uh, Toby, on the drawing set um, provided by the applicant, it seems to appear that four lots are currently zoned as future land use neighborhood commercial. Um, that's on C.003, and that all four are changing. But I think it's just one on the eastern side of Village, correct? That's correct. And so really just that drawing is shown incorrectly on its existing conditions portion. Yeah, I think so. Let me see if I can see what you're looking at. Um, yeah, that, there's just one lot there. It's They're kind of showing half of the what looks north, but really is eastern lot there on C.003 that I wanted to make sure wasn't accidentally being forgotten or it just <laughs> yeah. needs clarity. Okay. Um, it does look like to me there's, oh yeah, they're just showing half of one lot there, the lot to the, to the further to the east um, to above the lot. There. Right. And so really, I guess my only question is not really necessarily what they're showing, but how many lots are currently zoned for neighborhood commercial future land use? Is it just the three or is it in fact four? The fourth one is zoned. So the one to the east of this property is zoned neighborhood commercial as well, even though it's currently developed with a uh, multiple family residential development. So that, 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 I, that existing conditions plan is correct. Um, but we are only talking about three of the four properties that are included in this neighborhood commercial zoning or, and I guess I should say neighborhood commercial land use map. So the, which is kind of then what you have shown on page two does yeah. is correct then at that point. And I might've um, misspoken. So there are four properties that are in the neighborhood commercial future land use classification. And there are three properties that are zoned neighborhood commercial. So. Um, the fourth property 
that is in the neighborhood commercial land use classification is already developed with multiple family development. So okay. uh, similar to a project kind of just up the hill that we discussed recently, um, a concern being about creating unintended consequence of spot zoning. My concern is that we're ignoring a fourth while trying to consider three of them. Is that something that staff reviewed? Is, is spot zoning an unintended consequence here? We didn't review that, but we would leave um, we would leave one property as part of the neighborhood commercials node. And, and just does, to clarify, we're not talking about zoning. We're talking about the future land use map. I will I will use future just, land get use map designation. Yes, That's I get fine. uncomfortable with the term spot zoning when we're I'm not worried about, about it. spot future land use map designating. <laughs> there would be one property that would remain as a neighborhood commercial um, land use future land use map. And then, so last clarification on that, as we are reviewing things tonight and knowing that this is brought forward from an applicant, but that the city can also review future land use map designating and zoning, uh, is it under our purview tonight to start to consider this fourth one, or is this the three are part of this application and they are only to be considered? I think we're only considering these three tonight. The city can decide if we want to change that future land use map designation. Um, we may want to do that as more of a holistic discussion about future land use in this general area um, if we do that in hopefully a future upcoming year or two when we talk about the area community plan and brian i had the Thank same you. concern on the last application up the street was that it was noticed that for example uh herbage's parking lot and pool didn't exactly match its use and the future land, you know, we were only considering that one lot, whereas the future land use map would, was not exactly matching existing conditions and zoning was different also. I, I had the same concern or question. Thank you. There's some questions from commissioners. Yeah. So we talked about this when we saw this a previous application on this property. Can you remind us why or what you believe why this is zoned uh, commercial neighborhood or future land use map is a commercial neighborhood at this time with surrounding non-commercial properties? I think the, the idea, the vision for this area was to have this um, be a commercial node to provide some small scale commercial development that might serve the surrounding residential uses. I think we discovered through this process that this is the only commercial node that we have in our future land use plan, um, even though we have a whole future land use category for these four properties. Um, so uh, in our review, just sort of of the existing conditions and of the, of the land use classifications, the neighborhood residential medium land use classification does still allow for some lim limited commercial development that would support residential. So the two land use classifications are fairly similar. Um, and support the same type of uses. So these properties have been undeveloped for the number of years that they've been undeveloped or underdeveloped. There's the office park on the other side, um, but there's a lot of land available there. So that's probably an underdeveloped property. Um, so it doesn't seem like that vision has, has come to light and there's, there's a need for housing. So just in that evaluation, we thought, um, we thought that these seemed appropriate to be residential and there would still be the potential if the market allows to develop some limited commercial there. So. And can you remind me what the, since we are looking at these uh, concurrently, uh, multifamily three and commercial neighborhood, what are the different requirements for, or allowances for commercial development on the, each of those, under each of those zone districts? I don't know if we've done the this concurrently. I think we'll talk about the zone district amendment next. So well, one can't be approved with the other, but okay. Yeah. Um, but the uses are similar. There's some limited commercial uses that are allowed in MF residential. Um, there are more commercial uses, non-residential uses that are allowed in neighborhood commercial. Um, however, there are still some, again, limited commercial uses that are allowed in MF3. And Rich, you describe I, what those are just while we're on the same page, while we're on that subject. Um, I don't know if I call, I, I'd have to look at our code. I'm sorry, I don't have that um, at the ready. I just think that there are more, um, as a commercial um, CN, 
is the is the zoning. It allows many more commercial uses than would be allowed in the MF. Um, but I imagine there could be some service uses, um, probably some retail uses that might be allowed in MF three. Um, I could restaurants. Yep. Yeah. So I, I can look it up. Is the question what non residential uses are allowed in MF? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and similarly, though, uh, residential becomes a use by right on its own as opposed to yes, the other way around in, in the current zoning. It's a, it's a limited use in the um, CN zone. So it has use standards. And when we previously looked at a multifamily residential development plan on the easternmost property of this application, uh, that one of the use standards required the multifamily residential, the similar, the same use that we just talked about on the last application, conditional use at the best pedestrian active frontage. Um, so that's one of the use standards in the CN zone or multifamily residential, those use standards don't apply in the MF because it's a use by right. So. If I cut you off when I was asking for clarity on that. That was a fine clarification. Okay. If I could follow, Tim, I, I didn't ask this before. What are the allowable zone districts under each of these two? Or what's the allowable zone districts under the residential, the new future land use map proposal? I mean, yeah. I think the allowable zone districts under the neighborhood residential medium are the MF zone districts. And under the neighborhood commercial future land use classification, I think we allow CN as the, as the zoning that's allowed under them. Thank you. Additional questions? I wanted to just add, if it helps, Rich, um, I did a little research with the previous owner of this property, which was a longtime owner. Are we, are we questioning or are we deliberating? Just I'm just clarify. saying the reason that it is zoned commercial is that it predates the annexation to Steamboat Springs. And then when they needed to assign zoning to it in the first code, um, that's how it kind of ended up being C and keeping to be C was at the landowner's preference, that just simple as that. It wasn't as if a body like this highly evaluated at code rewriting time, they left it the same as it had been because it was one owner for like 45 years. Additional questions from commissioners? The staff agree with that. You were talking about the KFMU, what was previously known as the KFMU building. You believe All that three of these were. Same owner, but they weren't all, weren't all the KFMU built. They were. No, right. they were all one owner that wanted right. to retain that commercial zoning and came in at time of the 80s code. And then again at the 2001 code and it went through. So it was never really professionally planned, but, but that was the history. Cause it really bothered me. What was the idea? Was, did previous planning commissions think this should be a commercial note? Should that be honored? And it was landowner preference. And staff believe that's a, like, a likely scenario, a possible scenario? It could be. I don't have that history, so it's possible. Sometimes when there are sort of quirks, if you might, if you may, on our future land use map, um, they may have been uh, property owner directed. So. Okay. Additional questions? Do you have another one? Go, yeah. please. Uh, we saw that public comment from Mr. Scott uh, on specifically this item that dispersed commercial is really not where we're going. Does staff have any follow-up there? I don't want to say corroborating evidence, but do they have a philosophy that that is a true intent and that that information is pretty accurate onto where we're going with, I think they use the term urban planning. Basically it said that, you know, there's dispersed commercial is not really ideal that it should be concentrated commercial. I think there's probably a, a variety of philosophies out there. I think that the, the commercial node philosophy that our area community plan uses um, can be viable. Uh, you, you see it in lots of old cities, places, Baltimore, Chicago, New York, will have corner stores, things like that. That might've been the plan for these, um, for these properties. And I think we do see just up the road at the corner of um, Village and Apre, I think, where Wild Plum and those other small, we see some small commercial development surrounded by MF. And those I, I believe are fairly successful commercial developments. So I think 
dispersed commercial in that context can work. I don't think it all needs to be concentrated. Dispersed commercial or neighborhood commercial does allow um, walkability. It does allow services to be closer to the residential. It does provide, you know, it removes things like food deserts. So I think it can be fairly, you know, helpful to have a, a corner store or a service provider near your residential use. That being said, I think that for most of the residential uses south of Walton Creek Road, um, it's still pretty walkable to get to those commercial services that are just up the way. So that might be serving the area as the commercial node. So. Thank you. Additional questions? Are there any questions? Uh, I want to come to you as well. Um, no, I'm fine. Thank you. Okay. I'll take this opportunity for public comment. If there's any member of the public who wishes to speak on this agenda item, you can come down, state your name and address, give us your thoughts. Right off the bat, I just want to clarify when Toby said Walton Creek Road and Apre, or uh, I believe uh, Apre uh, Village, maybe? No, she said, I think Apre Ski up the street, and you said Village. Am I, are we talking Walton Creek Road and Village Drive? We are. Okay, so yes, I have public comment. Thank you for your time. Um, Richard Eberhardt, 1919 Walton Creek Road. I better have Monica Fenton. Um, first to comment on the, the last meeting when we were here and the developers were proposing their residential building development. And it seemed like we were going through a whole bunch of ifs and uh, 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 things of trying to fit this. And I made a comment of a, a square peg in a round hole. Uh, right now, I guess it's zone mixed residential commercial use. And we're trying to see if we wanted to go to residential use. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So. At that time, this is just a comment on my behalf. If you voted it down because it wasn't residential, it was commercial, I don't know why we got the cart in front of the horse. That's all I have to say. It just, it seemed like there was a lot of, you know, going on. And maybe I'm mis mistaking and understanding the process on my part, but uh, there's a lot of variances a lot of stuff going on. And then instead of just saying to the developers, you can't build until we go through this process where we're going through right now. And this is where we're at right now. This is what I'm saying, if I'm correct. Uh, I could be wrong. But anyway, so now if we're going to take and change it to residential, and uh, I know we're, we're wondering and knowing that why that's going to be changed is because the developers want to develop on this, these lots. And when uh, the gentleman talked about talking to the last owner that I don't understand why in 2001, you mentioned that the owner on his behalf made it a commercial zone, not the city. You sort of implied, I thought. Earlier than that, but. Huh? <clears throat> much earlier than that, but. Uh, the, what was that? It says that happened earlier than 2001, that's all. But, well, again, <laughs> I don't understand how that can happen. Anyway. Uh, if it's going to go back to residential, I guess uh, my question would have to be, we would term residential. Is it a house or is it going to be short-term residential or short-term rentals? Uh, I would imagine uh, we're in the process now of hearing all these editorials and uh, city council meetings about short-term rentals. And if it goes to short-term rentals, if the builders allowed that, I don't know. I thought the overlay zones that they were talking about, this is where it becomes so confusing to me. Everything north, north of Walton Creek Road would be considered short-term rentals. Everything south would be not considered short-term rentals or available. My question would be is if the developers have discussed to the planning commission, if they were gonna use these properties as short-term rentals when they build their units. I don't know if you know that or not. Do we know that everything north 
of Walton Creek Road would be allowed short-term rentals and everything south would be not allowed short-term rentals with the overlay zones? We don't know that either. Huh? We don't know that either. You, you don't point. know that either. Okay. So I guess let's see. Uh, sort of comes back to the first lady at the meeting with going through all these processes with the developer and allowing variances and everything. It seems like the property owners that are around and the tax paying citizens were not allowed to take and have comment. I could be wrong. Uh, when all these supposedly maybe minor variances are allowed, but when we're talking traffic and glare and noise and congestion and housekeeping coming in, uh, it's sort of important to the homeowners. So I guess what I'm asking is if this goes into a residential plan to where the developers can build this, would the city get, give us guidance as well as what the lady asked for earlier on uh, and having time to voice our opinion uh, with, all, with, with, with the due process before some, before you allow the, you know, all these, you know, minor variants supposedly to go through. Okay. Is that possible? Uh, public comment could be something that could be a part of a future application, certainly, especially if it went to uh, a city thing. Um, so we yeah. typically try and keep public comment to three minutes per person. I understand. And, I, and, uh, I'm trying to hurry. Yeah. So that just ask uh, yeah, for yeah. a summary, but I, go on. And I, I sat through the whole Steamboat Springs presentation. So anyway, uh, I guess if it does go residential, uh, well, the, the other thing would be is if right now you're talking about one is zoned and you being used as commercial use. Well, the one that's across from the commercial use on the west side of Walton Creek Road on the southwest side was commercial use. KFMU was in there, uh, computer cures, and used as commercial use building. Uh, so that's two commercial uses right there out of the four that were and in existence in commercial. Uh, I believe the owners said that the people that were used in commercial use had to take and leave and gave them a timeline to get out of the building. Uh, that's a comment on my part. The only other thing I have is when we were here uh, just last week in another matter at the city, uh, we spoke with Toby and this is a question to the whole council. Toby implied if, if we allowed it to go through to residential, so uh, the developers could build on these properties, it might be a better option or better alternative than the, you know, than having it stay commercial. My question is, is if, if she was speaking hypothetically, that's fine. But if there's been discussion on anybody's part, I, I would hope that we should have that information available to us to where we could be here talking to you about all these changes. So, I'm actually stating, I believe that we would not want this to go to residential. We'd want it to stay commercial. Okay. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Any additional public comments on this agenda item? Seeing none, is there any online? I think you've got it. I talk online. It's muted. Seems Eric. Is there somebody online who's muted who would like to speak on this agenda item? I would have guessed that that was just discussion happening in the room, but uh, seeing none, uh, we'll close the public comment portion. Uh, any final uh, comments or response from the applicant? Uh, Phil Rankich again with Steamboat Architectural. Um, one last time we were in here, one of the comments that we had from a couple of adjacent property owners is, was while they objected to some of the elements of the design we had, they would prefer to see residential there versus commercial. So that's one of the reasons why we're here. 
Okay, thank you. Any final response from staff? Um, the only thing I can offer is that um, this is the process to provide your comment on the future land use map and the zoning. We are gonna talk about the zoning amendment next. So this is where you can you know, have your input. You can also have input at the city council sessions as well. So um, this, is, this is the opportunity where the community can be involved. And, and so you're here for it. So this is the discussion that's happening now. So. And did, were you able to find the commercial uses? Yeah, so um, in the MF3 zone district, the only allowed non-residential uses are childcare centers and rec centers. So though the, uh, the purpose of the MF uh, zone district and the future land use classification for neighborhood residential medium both indicate that limited commercial uses would be allowed, I guess they are very limited to those two commercial uses. So there may be a slight disconnect between the uses in our code and what our zone districts and community plans say, but again, we hope that maybe we can reevaluate that with some future community plan discussions. So, okay. And any final questions from commissioners? Okay, seeing none, I'll close the public portion, come to commissioners for discussion and a motion. Yeah, I, um, I recall this. Uh, from a while ago, um, that lonely lot that never wants to be developed. Um, uh, I am a little surprised <clears throat> that the KFMU complex, whatever we call it, uh, has not thrived, but uh, in terms of a commercial enterprise. Uh, but I'm not uh, devastated by it because I think as staff pointed out, this is a transition zone. And I think it is a, an important transition zone. Uh, so from that standpoint, I'm supporting the amendments to the land use plan and the, and the, the zone. So, and I assume we'll see all development applications as they come in. And that's another avenue for the public to comment is when we have specific developments to uh, to go to. Okay. So is that was that a motion or was that just discussion? That was, that was just discussion, but uh, I have no problem. And I assume we're doing these separately. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I motion to approve PL 2022-00010 uh, with, uh, no, well, there are no conditions on it. Conditions, yeah. Second. Motion, we have a second, any discussion? Uh, I'm kind of torn. Uh, even Toby uh, alluded to the fact that our community area plan does discuss the idea of uh, neighborhood commercial zones, even if this is the only uh, island in, the, in all of our future land use map. And then we get to the point of, is it commercial, not commercial because commercial is not viable, or maybe we just haven't reached that point yet. I mean, there's a lot of places that, I mean, I could say the ski area. I mean, oh, there's no commercial on Ski Time Square. Maybe we should make that residential. And is that because? And so there's a timeline that we don't, that I don't understand anyway. That over time, more commercial is going to be needed everywhere. I mean, we don't. I don't think we have enough commercial space to serve our growing community. And would this be a decent spot? Is this a viable spot uh, for urban planners? They do have whether it's a neighborhood grocery store or uh, there were a few other things that were spot that they're allowed. Um, and I don't remember our discussion for the last application why we you could have put residential on the ground floor in this commercial zone that was legal, that was a conditional use. And now we're saying we didn't want it then, but we're going to pretty much allow it now. Um, so I'm kind of torn. I understand that it hasn't been developed and it possibly it's underutilized now. But do we wait for the future or are we just going to let it go res residential because it certainly seems like the, there is lots of residential demand right now. And there's probably also some financial residential demand more than commercial financial demand. And to me, that's not necessarily the reason to be changing this little island. Well, I, 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 to, me, to me, there are two issues. One is it is a little island apparently. Uh, the second is the commercial enterprise that has been attempted there has not thrived in at least 10, 15 years? 20, what does that mean? 30, not 35, 40, 
Oh, okay. I've been here 30 I mean, it, it's There's people in there. It's being used now. It's well. Is it underused? Is it full? No. I don't know that. That's why I'm not. You're saying it hasn't thrived. I know that people have. All, but if it hasn't, I, I, does I, that I, have to do with the with the uses location or the experience possible on that property currently? Could could be just a lot of variables when you're going down that road. I'm just yeah. saying, consider them all. But it's been a long time since there's been a lot of activity on that site commercially. And I suspect a lot of that does is something to do with the location and where it is. I don't know the answer because the one thing it has, it has parking, which well, it does. <laughs> I'm in a couple of places that don't have it. And if I were looking for an office, that would be just as viable as any other because parking is a huge concern with existing buildings. Uh, the office place I'm in now has, has challenges. The office I used to be in has challenges and they're not getting any better. But I don't know the answers to all those questions, and that's why I'm not sure. Additional discussion? Okay, I'll weigh in. I'm, I've been wrestling with this concept since, you know, since the last application came forward and continuing into considering how future land use map might change. Um, wrestling with it in the sense that I understand both those sides that have been brought up so far. And I'm certainly, um, you know, Rich, I can, I can say I, I'm very much wondering the same thing that you're wondering. And I, and I want to wonder it out loud as part of our discussion. I wonder out loud, are we losing an opportunity for commercial in a neighborhood aspect, which is wildly successful? Granted, it's easier to it's easier to point to bigger cities, right? Because you have more land that you can that you can show how neighborhood development is successful in those areas. But some of the things uh, that uh, Ms. Stoffer uh, kind of brought up um, about walkability to commercial services from a neighborhood and the improvement that that provides on a neighborhood, whether or not the owners of the property have filled that niche doesn't mean that that's not a successful neighborhood. Uh, amenity is the word that's coming to mind, but amenity is not the right word, but hopefully that kind of conveys the, the point that I'm getting at. And I'm very much wrestling that out loud uh, of whether or not this is very much um, underutilized, but possibly very intentionally a commercial where it is. And are we losing an opportunity that we won't get back if we lose it. I'm wondering that out loud more than anything. I very much understand, like I say, the flip side uh, and, and the current possibility to develop residential, which we are very much in need of. Uh, I very much understand that side as well, but I'm, I'm worried about that lost land opportunity. That's, that's I guess, where I'll leave that. You know, Rich, I you, I didn't see it until you said it. Uh, and, and I wonder if the current situation, if we created somewhat of an unnatural situation right now, and if we prevented any new projects from going short-term rental, would that, would this now become more commercially viable? Uh, well, essentially it is, right? It is commercially, it's gonna be a commercial building. It's gonna be an STR, building. Um, I, I, I didn't see it till you had me see that side of it. Additional discussion? Martin, always looking to get you involved here. No, I'm, I'm seeing both sides too. Um, it, it's, uh, it's a tough one because I, I think Rich makes some very valid points that there's a, certainly no proof that this isn't a potentially viable site in the future I and mean, then possibly even now uh, um so I, I i see that um and we are eroding our commercial land use options uh, repeatedly on the commission having been on this commission now for what six seven years um that that does concern me anybody else a chance? Rich, were you leaning forward, please? I'll just say one more thing. That's that 
just like since the application we saw before, if it were to stay, the zone, the zoning and the future land use map were to remain the same, they can come forward and ask for no commercial on the ground floor. That's a conditional use. Whereas if we change it to multifamily, if we change the future land use map, sorry, and the, and the very the, the few potential zone districts that it will allow, we are saying that we are limiting any potential commercial. Whereas the current the current future land use map does not prevent residential on the ground floor. It just gives us it just tells us to please review. And I don't know. I'll just leave it at that. That's an interesting point. I'll just dwell in on that for a minute. Uh, any other discussion? No? Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I would also voice, I mean, knowing that this is also a recommendation to council uh, that the missed fourth lot and, and not considering altogether makes me just wonder aloud if that's uh, not as clean as we could have otherwise done this. If there was any way that we could clean that up as well, that that would be interesting, but I understand uh, staff's answers to my earlier questions. Um, but I will stop now, and instead I will call the question. You change my vote, Rich, no. Yes. Uh, super reluctantly, no. No. Yes, yes. Martin? No. Is that three to four opposed? Three, four, four, three. Uh, so with that motion failed, is there a different motion? I'll move to deny PL 2022000010. We have a motion, do we have a second? Second. Yes. Any discussion uh, with a new motion? Um, I, I think I think Rich is right that if we if we approve this motion, it doesn't deny a future application to come back and say, as we've done many times before, um, let, let's remove the ground floor commercial, um, and we debate that given the proposal. Um, but but if we did it the other way. It, it would certainly, again, evaporate and remove another potential uh, commercial nodal site. Martin, I think that's a good point. I, I might add to the discussion on that, that not only is there an opportunity to do it uh, with looking at removing commercial, there's an opportunity for development that has both, that it has a very mixed use that still can find a way to serve that commercial node. Um, use while still providing the much needed residential? Is there a, a best case scenario in there? You know, just just looking at the future viability of the lots um, that I see that as well. Any other discussion? I'll call the question. Aye. Juan, maybe as a clarification, since we voted no on the first one, can you vote? You can vote however you want on each individual I, motion. <laughs> okay. Um, some some helpful reasoning to council might be helpful though. On, yeah. But, yeah, but whatever is your prerogative. Um, I'll vote no. Mike? Yes. No. No. Martin? Yes. That motion passes four to three. Thank you for your time. Was item seven relevant anymore? Toby? If they were to. Still an application. However, the zone change would be less consistent with the current community plan as is. Um, so uh, we should probably still make a decision on it. Okay. So um, the, the clarification I might have on that as we discuss that would be that your findings are based off of the future land use map supporting the zone change. If we're not supporting that, then those findings are hard to... They are hard to... Maybe just hard to support, but it's still an application. Is that yeah. kind of where you're going with still that? need to provide a, a decision and a recommendation. They still have a request. Right. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. So... Um, and, and can I just clarify, 
um, not only is the staff findings based on um, the assumption that the not the assumption, but based on a scenario where the prior application were to be approved, I believe that our suggested motion includes a condition of such. So um, if that ultimately were to be denied, then the rezoning would also not carry forward. Does that make sense? I believe so. Okay. There is that, con there is that condition on your recommended motion, so. Uh, that being said, we were kind of reviewing these concurrently. No, we really weren't. Um, so we'll, we'll start back over with a um, presentation, I believe, on this is a new agenda item. Yeah, I, um, so again, the, so the current land use map designation is neighborhood commercial. Um, this request is to change the zoning to um, MF3, multiple family residential three, which is our highest density residential. Uh, we did find that um, it was consistent with a change to the community plan amendment um, to change that to neighborhood residential. Uh, there are some differences uh, between the CN standards and the MF3 standards, um, notably in, in height and lot coverage and floor area ratio. So there are a few more opportunities for increased height in the MF3 than there are in the CN. So a CN zoned property would be a lower potential overall building. Um, there, are, as we mentioned, there are a number of different uses that could happen in CN. Um, there are mostly, of, there are some of those would, that would probably be, um, there are some conditional uses like MF residential or uses with standards um, in the CN as well. So I think the CN overall offers more uses, more developable uses on this property. So those are the main differences between the, the property uh, zonings. Uh, again, the future land use category of neighborhood commercial does allow, it's more commercial based with some residential allowed, whereas the MF or the neighborhood residential medium future land use category is sort of residential focused with some limited commercial allowed. So in both future land use classifications, um, it does seem like the zoning could work but the zoning of CN is more consistent with the current future land use um, designation. So though our, we did find that it could, um, this zone map amendment could be supportable. It does transition well um, between the zoning on the adjacent properties and the, the zoning across the street. Um, it doesn't seem like there is maybe quite enough uh, MF3 zoning uh, as we have a need for housing in this, um, in this community. So that was one consideration. We did find that the advantages out outweighed the disadvantages. Um, again, the allowing for a variety of residential uses. And again, through the purpose uh, and the future land use classification allowing for some development of non-residential uses. Um, but the disadvantage is that there is less opportunity for development non-residential. Um, and it, it did seem like the information provided by the applicant, uh, the consultant, who studied the commercial uses um, made some, some points similar to David's points that um, commercial use has, has not been successful so far um, or very successful. And I should note that the, the building was rented though it's, um, it's currently vacant. So there's no uses in that, in that building right now. So um, I can answer questions or we can talk more about it if you'd like. Thank you. I had, I had a question. Does the applicant also have a presentation? Uh, for this agenda? I have a question for the applicant. But technically we'll get to questions right after, for sure, for sure, for sure. Hi, uh, Jason Lacey, Steamboat Lawyers Group, uh, representing the applicant, former planning commission member and city council member. Thank you for your time and your service. Uh, just wanted to say um, a few words. Um, you, you mentioned earlier, you know, one of the comments I heard on the last application was, you know, give some comments to help city council. I guess one of the things that I know the applicant is frustrated about and, and probably city council would like to hear is, um, you know, we've heard a lot about some what ifs and some speculation, particularly from the people that voted down the last application. What I did not hear was any discussion of the criteria itself. I heard nothing about which criteria were not met. 
Uh, I didn't, didn't hear any specifics on that. I think that would be really appropriate. Certainly if any application is gonna be turned down to um, spell out which criteria are, are not being met. As far as this, uh, the zone map amendment goes, I mean, the, this is obviously an area where, you know, this is kind of a commercial, I don't know if you call it a desert or an oasis out there. Uh, it's obviously not been highly utilized. It seems like um, a very appropriate, you know, place for MF3 zoning, particularly when the surrounding properties are all already in the, or many of them are MF3 zoning already. Um, so, just uh, like to get some, you know, the applicant I'm sure is a little frustrated. They've been trying to work with the city and work with the community to do what seems to be the appropriate path here to find a way to approval. And just uh, like to hear a little more discussion about which criteria you think are not being met. Thank you. Thank you. Questions to, from commissioners, to applicant or staff, please. I only had one question tonight. Um, on, in the plan set C, zero zero three there's a kind of color representation that i think is meant to show the differences between the two zone districts and my question is i had trouble understanding the difference between and maybe it's the staff or maybe the applicant could clarify but basically if it stays commercial green and some red would be the setbacks. Yeah. And then if it were residential, then the red setbacks would only govern. So what they're showing in those two chains, so you'd look at C003 and C100 together. So C003 is the existing conditions plan. And what they're showing there is the setbacks that are required by the CN zoning and showing the the potential buildable area. Um, so the buildable area in those on C003 is uh, the white area. Um, the green, so the CN zoning has a variable setback, a variable front setback. So the, the green is the variable area where they okay, could. That, that answers it. So it's not a comparison necessarily between the dimensional standards of the two zone districts. It's how C is analyzed. Well, and it is it is a comparison of the dimensional standards. So the the blue, so the second plan, the zone map amendment is the proposed. It's the MF three um, setbacks, and so the MF three front and side setbacks are the red. So those are kind of hard no build areas, or they would require a variance to encroach into those areas. The blue is a is a I think it's a third floor setback setback. So um, I think they're just trying to show the potential density and massing that could happen on each of those properties with the setbacks as they're shown. So um, my basic question was, what was the difference between the two green diagrams and the one blue diagram? And I think you've answered my question. I think the green and the blue in both of those diagrams to be more specific is a, is a variable thing. Is a commercial analysis. And then the residential analysis is, would be one way to say it if it were rezoned uh the blue just indicates a subtlety in the code of top or upper floor yeah there's a okay. there's a step back requirement in the mf so they've got a, a step back on okay. that third floor which is the blue so i struggled with that a little bit just it was helpful but i thought we might be evaluating a zone change and i couldn't understand the dimensional standards yeah. other than in the chart yeah i did I did prepare them in the chart. So that's a more that direct helpful. comparison of that those dimensional helpful. standards, which might, um, there's there's more than what they've like shown. 15 versus 10 and so forth. Yes, yeah. But this is a graphic representation that's accurate of right. the building area. Yeah, I think, as I mentioned, the, uh, the height standards, lot coverage and floor area standards are all different between those two districts. Um, so they would be relevant. Um, for the building, future building massing that could be on either on um, those properties. So. Additional questions. Just to be clear, staff, that this agenda item doesn't go to plan. It will only go to city council. They'll only decide on it if they overturn our decision on the no. Um, we will still provide 
So this agenda item will still go to city council. It so, will likely have two recommendations, one from staff and one from planning commission, and they will, they will decide um, what the outcome of these items are. They are tethered together um, to their outcome. So they will either be approved or denied together. So even if they deny the future land use change, they're still gonna have to vote on the zoning change? even though that zone district is incompatible with the current future land use, the presumed future, you know, the future land use map. I don't understand that process, to be honest. The, they would still zone, vote on it. They may still say that it, um, they might may be able to make different findings, that it is consistent with the area community plan. They may find that it doesn't need to change, so. Okay. City Council is the, the decision maker and we have an application before us so there there would be two applications that would go to city council one they may vote no on which then may be a precursor to the vote on the second application but they would still have to take a vote okay is it is it fair to help add clarification to it to talk about how this used to be a, a denial would never even go to council unless there was an appeal as opposed to now the process goes to council despite a no vote because it is just a recommendation vote and that that's kind of a change that happened. Is that a fair? Yeah, I think we we did have a process in the past that some applications would stop here, but I think we, we clarified some of those steps in our code. So we're always providing, um, in this case, recommendations and city council does need to make the final decision, even if that decision perhaps is sort of um, scripted Perhaps that's maybe not the best word, but I can't find the word I'm looking for, but we'll see. We'll see how this goes and their vote may be similar. You never know. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So There's no questions yet, please. A little clarification, Toby. Maybe I misunderstood what you said earlier or what was said earlier. I don't know if you or Rebecca said it. The zoning for these lots, well, the future land use map is and I'm going to paraphrase recommended land use, the zoning does not have to follow that. So while you have tied together the two, we as planning or city council could vote. They don't have to be tied together and change the zoning, right? You would have to make findings for the criteria, yeah. but our, our area community plan does list recommended zone districts that would be um, part of those future land use maps. So if we were doing this from scratch, the future land use map would say, here's what we think the land use should be, and here's what we think the zoning should be, and then we implement the zoning to make those changes in the future land use map happen. Um, so, so, But it's recommended, not required. Um, the future land use map guides our decision makings, and the zoning um, implements those. Is it a guide or a requirement? That's what I'm trying to get to. Okay. Rebecca's I think smiling. if you look at the... <laughs> criteria for approval noted in your staff report. Yeah. You'll see that when you're making a recommendation and council's making a decision on a zoning, a rezoning request, one of the criteria for approval is whether it's consistent with the Steamboat Springs area community plan or any other adopted plans. Okay. So in, in to answer your question, council would have to planning commission and council would have to make a finding that it is consistent. There may be circumstances where the future land use map wouldn't have to perfectly match the zoning. Um, but if you're inclined to approve the zoning, I would question why. I understand. I don't, I don't see it, pass, the I don't see it changing map. at this level, but I was yep. more trying to understand the process and what council might do. You have the, the criteria for approval are required. So obviously reasonable minds can come to different findings. Um, but I think it would be difficult to find it consistent without the prior agenda item, item being approved. I've never claimed to be reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Toby, you said that one of the reasons uh, planning approved it was because we wanted more, more housing for residents. Is there a way for developers to somehow put into the, their, when they're selling this, that it would have to go to residents is, is, as opposed to becoming all short-term rentals? Is there a way to do that? 
They would no. do that through their covenants, which we don't usually um, mandate or manage through our process. But they could they could come forward and they could tell us that when they were presenting it, right? I mean, Typically conceivably. Typically happen in a development plan. Um, they haven't, it could also happen in a zone map amendment, but they haven't um, suggested that any of the um, uses would be allowed, would not be allowed. So any, all the, sorry, let me start over. All of the uses in the MF3 zoning that are allowed on other MF3 properties would be allowed on these properties. So they haven't subtracted or added any um, from the existing uses that are allowed. So. Additional. And, and I'll just add to that, that would not be something we would typically consider in a zone map amendment. That could be something that could be proposed as part of a development plan voluntarily by the applicant and then included in their covenants ultimately restricting their own uses but we don't make we don't zone we don't we don't make um special conditions of zoning when we change the zone map additional questions yeah i just want to make sure if can i be can we recommend can we approve this request based on only on the assumption that the future land use map would be overturned by council. I mean, because I'm in that dichotomy. Kind of, obviously, I don't want to see this MF3, but if council were to say they want to change the future land use map, that puts me in a different position of what the zone should be. It can't remain commercial neighborhood. What's the right process there? I think. Um... The, the two projects do sort of go together. So I think mm -hmm. it's hard to, um, at, at this point, approve one since the previous one was denied. Um, I think that provides some very unclear direction to the applicant and to council as to what you'd like to see happen at this corner. Well, but the way the suggestion is here it has a criteria of subject to the approval of the community plan so couldn't it be approved subject to approved subject to the plan getting approved by city council yeah. or we could do it either way i could i, I could still vote no but say obviously if it were to, if they change the future land use map obviously it has to go to a multifamily i think you you guys are providing a recommendation to council on what should be happening current and future on this property um so if the future land use map doesn't change, it seems like the zoning, the current zoning is also consistent. Mm -hmm. So if you believe that, it sounds like at least four of you believed that the current land use map, the future land use map is correct. And so therefore the zoning would also be correct. And I'd frankly like to hear a justification for why, you know, some concrete findings of why this rezone should not be approved excluding the future land use map. I put less stock in a future land use map that notoriously has minor errors. And the way things came to be zoned certain ways tend to go through many rewrites to not take away a rights, to give property owners the closest zoning in the new code that matches their, and, and there's lots of lots of history to that. And it's impossible as someone who sat through a code rewrite of 90 meetings to go to every single block and corner in the intent for staff or people participating in the process. And so what ends up happening is individual landowners come in and usually uh, explain why they wanna be something. So the point to me is, I think it's compatible with the surrounding uses to rezone this property. I think that uh, even though I might dream that it were commercial or that commercial was viable there or that a proposal would come in that was a really neat commercial development, uh, that's not what we're considering. And the code has provisions to rezone property. The code also has provisions to um, modify the future land use map. So with that said, I'm just really kind of stuck of... Um, you know, what can you do with this property? And you have to, you know, what's your real finding? Why should it be commercial? Uh, I think it's a question a to them. We're not really in deliberation mode at the moment. Well, whatever. I'd just like to hear that from the group. I don't know when we're going to deliberate. We can do that in a minute then, yeah. 
still an initial public comment. Yeah, we're not. No, we're not there comment. yet. No, but we're probably about to be. <laughs> Hang on, just a sec. Unless there are any other additional questions to staff or the applicant, then there's not. So let's open up to public comment. If there's any member of the public who wishes to come, give us your thoughts. Jim Cook. I've been a commercial real estate broker and steamboat and developer for 32 years. I've been a member of the Urban Land Institute for 40 years. I don't know what the hell is going on here. Um, I don't know what this figment of a dream is for commercial in this area, whether it's a node or what it is, because if any of you were at the Economic Development Council Summit, we had a very, very learned speaker, last speaker on the agenda that talked about the need to compress and condense our commercial and keep it tight in areas. Usually I'd be in here arguing for a commercial zoning. Instead, you're protecting a commercial zoning and I don't know what you think the use of that is going to be. It's not gonna be a mom and pop store with the fruits and vegetables out front and crates that, that the neighbors are going to use again because they've got a city market that's a stone's throw away and a four acre parcel next to Alpine Bank that just sold where additional retail is gonna be developed you've not said what commercial use you want in there. If it's a doctor's office, if it's a, if it's daycare center, which there's always there's already one close by, what we need in this community is housing and daycare. The price point of this housing will fit a certain market that is not being served right now. I can't answer the questions about short-term rentals. That, will either come about through the HOA docs or with the overlay map. But I can assure you there's not going to be thriving any kind of retail development in this location. I have 18,000, let me repeat that. I have 18,000 vacant square feet in various buildings in downtown Steamboat right now. You put on top of that the vacancies of which there's two in Central Park Plaza and the, the additional retail to be developed. What's your vision for these nodes? Now that's a that new urbanism, when that was in vogue, maybe that was part of the reason for these. At the time, it probably made sense. But the one thing that's predictable in this world is change. And that has changed. The other thing that hasn't been brought up, and I was going to save it for city council, but the thing I've been working with the Partovis on for this particular project, and I'm going to be working on some other projects, is that they are going to self-impose a transfer fee on each one of these units to be sold. It's going to be designated for daycare. <laughs> because right now we need daycare in this community, and it would take $100,000 minimum to help support another daycare center, and we're only serving 15% of our needs. So where I would, normally I'd be cheering on, God, we've got another commercial site. We don't need another commercial site up there. What we need is residential units. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Any additional public comment? Well, in due respect, I guess uh, you mentioned uh, the, the feasibility of other uses for commercial property. And I don't know if why we're discussing who's here to say what's feasible or not for the builder or for commercial property. It's up to the, the whoever develops that property to decide. Uh, and the daycare across the street is already there. We might need more daycare. We might need more doctor's offices and uh, human resource buildings, uh, anything that would be commercial use. Uh, going back to the a discussion we had earlier, uh, you were talking about how people were already in that one KFME building uh, using it. They're not in there now, they're out. They'll, the, the owners took them out and said, you can't be here anymore. That's it, that, that building is vacant right now. So, uh, I, I guess it, it's been very confusing, just like Mr. Cook said. I, 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 
uh, legalese, I can't follow the, the bouncing ball. So I apologize, but I appreciate your time and your consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional public comment? Hello, uh, Jason Partobi, uh, 1897 Hunters Drive. I just wanted to come in front of you and introduce myself. I've been kind of staying in the back for the last few meetings. Um, my family and I uh, own and operate Skull Creek Greek and Hypnotic Chicken as well. So we're active members of this community. Um, when our family decided to pursue this project on uh, Village and Walton, um, the KFMU building was um, at 75% occupancy with rates far below the market rate. Uh, they struggled for years to get it full. The commercial viability of that corner, um, I mean, as an entrepreneur, uh, someone who moved here, who operates businesses in this town, I feel like this is the best use for that, for that land. And, um, you know, given all the, the due diligence and research we've done, hired an experts to kind of help guide us and what makes sense in that space, we've come to this, uh, to this point. And uh, I just wanted to kind of get in front of you guys, introduce myself, give you a little bit of background on, you know, who I am, who we are. I have three children here in Steamboat in schools. My son is in discovery across the street there. so. Uh, you know, we feel that this is the best use for this space, moving to a MF3 zoning um, and uh, being able to uh, build some uh, residential units which are in, in dire need right now in this community. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, seeing no other public, uh, we'll close the public portion and... Uh, I guess that was maybe a little bit uh, applicants' final final response. Uh, but if there are any more applicants' final response, uh, this would be the time. If you have any, okay. Or staff, any final response? No. Any final questions from commissioners? Yep. Then I'll close public portion. Come to commissioners for discussion and a motion. Well, I think we talked about the issues. A couple of times. I'm still a little confused as to whether or not we can approve this. I assume we could motion and then either vote for it or not vote for it um, in terms of the zoning. I, from my standpoint, uh, I think the idea of reserving this for some future commercial enterprise that may or may not happen. I don't think it's happening in the next 20 years. And uh, it, that need is gonna be residential need for the next 20 years. So from that standpoint, I guess what I will do is I'm going to motion to approve staff recommendation uh, for PL 20220011 and the zone map um, amendment. Luke, motion. Uh, question for you, Lou. With or without the contingency? Um, I'll amend that to uh, add the contingency. To add the contingency. And the contingency is whether or not council overturns it, right? That's well overturned the previous. Basically, overturns previous. I'll second that, and I, I believe you know I'm stating findings. By, I believe in improving it this way, we are retaining the integrity of the underlying future land use map because we're saying that we would accept a MF3 zoning of this if the future land use use map is changed. So I'm seconding it on that ground. And did I state that clearly? Yeah, that's good. Okay. It's From a nuanced. process standpoint, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? I have some points to make. I'm still confused. 
I don't know what what to do about this um, <laughs> that position that we kind of put in, but uh, one of the public comments were pretty uh, forward about we didn't really cover certainly I didn't cover the basis on why I didn't approve didn't want this to go residential, and I think some of those things apply to this as well. So I'm going to read some community area plan goals that I feel are important for this to remain com commercial. Uh, the future land use map says uh, neighborhood commercial may be located at an arterial and collector road, which I believe this intersection is. Uh, there is discussion in the area plan about uh, commercial activity nodes, but I couldn't find any specific ones that related to this one. Uh, land use 1.2 says we will create mixed use neighborhoods. Land use 1.3a says we need to have a jobs and housing ratio that we don't want to be just all residential units, that we have to maintain some commercial uh, units. Land use 2.1b says require mixed use developments in our, in our land use planning. Uh, ED, uh, it's an economic development, 1.2, adequate supply of commercial units. And uh, ED 2.1a, support local businesses. And it seems like just these small lots have that potential. It's not as direct as some of the other ones, but I think there are plenty of goals that support this remaining commercial and uh, that were really not specifically dis discussed during uh, why we should change it. So I haven't heard enough uh, evidence that it needs to be residential. And as I said, it could still be residential with the current zoning. Um, I guess I'll go. <laughs> I hadn't said anything else. Uh, in an attempt to uh, show findings based on code, uh, I will say that for this agenda item, the application is not supportable in as much as currently the future land use map does not match the zone change to MF3, the current land use map is to support neighborhood commercial. And as uh, staff mentioned uh, previously, um, what those zones are to be in that case uh, doesn't allow this to change to MF3. And so what I think makes a better sense uh, as a recommended approval or denial is to suggest that in my findings, even though I would be voting no on this application now, if the land use map were different, if the land use map supported neighbor or neighborhood residential medium, then all of the criteria as presented would be very acceptable and I would very much be recommending approval. I'm not only on the basis that that is not what's before us at the moment. So I don't see this as something to vote yes on with the contingency. I see it voting no with clarification. Uh, and so that's how I'll be, even though I'm kind of getting to the same place as the motion or suggested, I think that that makes cleaner uh, process than to try and make a positive motion without findings that can support it at the moment. That being said, any other discussion? I apologize that I jumped out of order I, to the public. I've, I thought we had gone through public comments, so sorry about that. No worries. Um, I, I just have, I, I just like to know, uh, what do you think this property should be used for? Let's use some common sense here. Um, and, and just go straight on, you know, uh, it sounds to me like the majority uh, thinks it should remain commercial and that it doesn't meet uh, measurable criteria to be reclassified or rezoned and i'm not comfortable with this motion because how could you vote for a rezone if you didn't i think those things likely should match for clarity and i'm i'm disappointed i think they've met the criteria i agree with the staff analysis um and i think that uh there were some very good points made that it would be nice if this property um had developed in its lifetime to be a viable commercial node, but it hasn't happened. 
and that's not what's being proposed. So I guess what I'm hearing is the majority is saying that they don't want to change the future land use and they don't want to hear they don't want to change the zoning. Because your argument is good, Brian, but um, that would mean you would only approve things that it's can be proven that the original zoning was like a mistake. In other words, future land use says it's all residential and then there's this little commercial island. No one can understand why. For example, we've seen applications in Old Town where we saw something zoned commercial and we changed it to residential because everything around it was residential and no one could determine why that was commercial. If you recall uh, on Maple Street uh, as an example. So, um, you know, we approved that. I don't understand why this is different. I'll take a stab at it and suggest that I think the future land use uh, has a lot to do with policy and future planning for our town and making sure that oh, yeah. short gains don't cause long-term problems. That That's what we're doing. Sometimes there can be an error in that and there's always an opportunity to, 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 to change that. But um, I know that we don't have currently as much uh, industrial need uh, in town as we have residential need, but I would not advocate that we just eliminate all industrial zones just to fill it up and then be like, oh, where the hell did all, all our industrial go? We have, to, we have to plan for the future, plan for the health of the future of the town as well as the current needs of the town. So it is different. In, and I would agree with you in the industrial zone. I think we're actually under zoned in industrial. And that's why residential projects have been turned down in industrial zones because it's valuable industrial and pretty well centralized and located. I agree with you, but I would argue that we have plenty of commercially zoned land in Steamboat. In fact, I would argue that we have an excess if you really developed it out. We've never done a study of that, but if you drive down Highway 40 and you look at all the vacant land, if it all developed to maximum, you know, or 80% of density, I think we would have too much commercial. Now, granted that's auto oriented, there's other arguments, but I think we've always had too much C on the map. And so in this case, I didn't have a lot of heartburn uh, switching to residential, but others have made good arguments and I'm in the minority. I, I think you make a really good point there at the end. And, and I think that that's maybe the only thing I'm trying to clarify with our discussion back and forth is not to, is only to suggest that along those lines of future land use and policy making that we were discussing that those other points that you were talking about that you were kind of conceding are other points that exist and maybe it's not where where you're at today um, but it is where i'm at today is that those other points have a lot of validity to them i would uh i would respectfully disagree with the um public commenter who suggested that we should be centralized in all commercial space i don't think that's that's proper city planning i don't think that's good for the long run of this town um auto oriented as you mentioned is just one of the many aspects to that and i think there's a lot of health to be gained from a town that that allows that and that allows for even a mixed use um like i said win-win opportunity uh within this node i don't think that it's a node that just needs to be lost but it is more policy based um and that's the only thing i'm kind of joining you in the conversation to to point out Along those lines, I would suggest, um, and I, I very much empathize with the uh, with the applicant and and their request uh, for more clarity on the first uh, application is to make sure that it does follow the criteria. Rich, um, <laughs> I would give you a lot of credit for uh, doing my job for me on, on laying out the, the ways that I think along those future policy decisions and how that fits into the criteria, what the reasons within the criteria are that it doesn't fit that policy, that there are a lot of community area plan goals that are not being met by approving it, and that those are the criteria that then force it into a no direction. Uh, that may not have been explained specifically as it relates to each criteria item, and, and definitely apologize along those lines. I always want to be as clear as possible, but that, um, Rich, you very uh, helpfully uh, kind of laid out very much what my opinion would be as well, to a large extent. That was a long sentence. Any other discussion on the motion? Um, you, you know, I, David, I'll, you, you know, you have a good point. What, what would, what do you, what do you want there? And honestly, what I think we need in this community, we need more residential housing. 
Uh, I think we could still use some more commercial businesses. What I don't think we need is, I just don't think we need any more second homes and STRs right now. I think we're in somewhat of a state of emergency. And I just think we need to house our citizens and, and have businesses for them to work in. That's where I'm at. And I, I would argue that's something the community's having a discussion about right now is regulating those rentals. So I wouldn't agree or disagree with that. But I, I tend to agree with you that um, newer, newer development um, may or may not go to short-term rentals, especially since we haven't even had a discussion about zone six where, where this property falls. So um, I didn't really take that into my account of a rezoning is what the future rental, I'm gonna kind of take that agenda separately and we can have that discussion next work session. Additional discussion, Rich? Um, I, I think the, the, it's not our job to say what we want other than some commercial. I think the list of potential commercial development is very long. And I, I would look at, and I'm looking at staff's analysis on page six uh, for the justification, the advantages and disadvantages. Advantage would allow a variety of residential uses. The sentence says, and there is still the potential for development of non-residential uses. I would add development of limited non-residential uses as Toby has uh, listed for us. The disadvantage of MF3 zoning provides less opportunity for the development of non-residential uses. That's in the staff report. And that's where I'm going because again, if it remains commercial, you can do mixed use. We're getting mixed use all over this town with commercial on the first floor and residential uses above it. And that's, that would be my vision of what I want to see on this zone without specifically saying a particular type of use. But it's generally related to um, resort oriented check-in recreation or um, uh, daycare. The, what is? In, in, if this were mixed MF. Use. Oh, if this were MF. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you can do mixed use in the residential zone district. It's just the uses are limited. A lot, yeah. Highly, I mean, in this particular, I mean, I there's only a couple of uses that could potentially be viable there, and I, I don't, I, I would rather see residential. I've already said that. Martin, any uh, thoughts? Yeah, an opportunity. Certainly, adding on to Rich's um, synopsis and your your support of it, uh, just seems to me that we're, we're all concerned with affordable housing. Um, we 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 have as a commission you know we're reviewing elsewhere the short-term rental um issue uh but it seems to me that its current its current zoning of cn is potentially more likely to see uh, with cn a, a more affordable uh unit uh configuration on a cn zoning so that that's something that hasn't been mentioned yet but maybe is in support of, of uh, CDC criteria that Jason asked about criteria. Uh, and um, I think uh, both Brian and Rich have given that criteria mix, uh, gone through the criteria well. And I would just add that last potential um, supporting criteria that we're more likely to see an affordable housing unit configuration with a CN than an MF3. Okay, thank you, Martin. Any other discussion? Don't want to cut anybody off. Can I ask one clarifying question, Mr. Chair, about the motion? Sure. Um, a few of you mentioned a contingency, and I wanted to see if the contingency is the condition that we have, which that's is what I assumed you meant. Is that map amendment? That's the way that I second. Okay. Yeah. Because you, you mentioned it, so I just wanted. Oh, to oh he yeah, not yeah. clarified. So motion with the with the one condition. With the one condition that basically the previous thing, whatever a 10 had to pass. Okay, thank you. So just to be clear, so we vote correctly, uh, could you restate the motion? Probably not at this point. Uh, I, I was, uh, the motion was to, uh, Is it to deny recommend or basically PL as written. Two zero two, yeah, basically as written. Basically two zero it's to approve it as written. So, as written. so what it's doing. I understand. Yeah, okay. Everybody feels good about that. I'll call the question. No. Yes. No. No. Yes. Yes. Martin. No. A motion fails four to three.
Need another motion? Uh, I'll move to deny PL 20220011 uh, based on the, some of the goals that I mentioned and the discussion previously with uh, uh, future land use map, I think we've outlined our reasons for why under the current circumstances, it shouldn't be MF3. And I just want to reiterate for clarity that that's, that's very much my <clears throat> reason to support your, you know, and I'll second your motion uh, is only based on the fact that the existing currently doesn't support MF3, the, excuse me, the existing future land use doesn't support MF3. And so as, as written, it should just uh, be a no vote, I, I believe, uh, as opposed to contingent on the other approval. You mean a yes vote? It should be a vote to deny. Motion. So thank you. Yes. Okay. Just don't, I no, very much. I appreciate mistake. very much, very much. Yes, so. Yep. Putting yeses on noes is always tricky. Uh, any other discussion? The motion is to deny. Motion is to deny. Not hearing any less discussion. I'll call a question. Uh, aye. Deny. No. Aye. Aye. No. No. Martin. Yes. That motion passes. You got it right. <laughs> Lots of information there to take to council. Uh, good luck. Thank you. Uh, agenda item number eight this evening, director's report. Um, I don't have anything to report other than we will continue our short-term rental discussion on Monday at our work session. And I believe that will be Tom's last meeting of the planning commission. We'll try Tommy to have a there. special lunch there. for you. My last date's the 31st. We're gonna have to say goodbye just yet. Something. You have one more day. <laughs> okay. Get Thank you, Rebecca. <laughs> Who knows? Welcome back, Commissioner Hearns. Just in time for... Agenda item number nine, February 28th, policy work session minutes. Motion to approve. Second. 28th minutes. Motion to second everybody in attendance. Uh, all in favor, say aye. Yes. Aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. And lastly, agenda item number 10, February 24th, public hearing minutes. <clears throat> everybody in attendance. Or move to Move to approve. Motion to approve. <laughs> and a second. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Passes unanimously as well. I believe that's <laughs> it for us tonight. Do we have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And we are adjourned at 7.53. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Martin.